While we're letting everyone in from the waiting room, I want to go over a couple basic features for everyone. As you can see, there's a chat window available on your screen. Please use this to ask any questions you have. You can also ask, access the chats by using Alt-H as an alternative shortcut. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started on some of the basic housekeeping while we let people filter in from the waiting room. Just let everyone know the event will be recorded. Okay. Good morning. Um, I think, uh, most of the people are in from the waiting room, so we'll get started. And welcome to the first of our series on how to engage with the AFRL research ecosystem, brought to you by the Basic Research Innovation and Collaboration Center, also known as the BRIC. My name is Lindsay Anderson, and I'm the program manager of the BRIC, and we will be your hosts for the morning. Today, we're gonna to provide information on how to do business with the Air Force Research Laboratory, from basic to applied. So you'll hear from the DOD Basic Research Office, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and our PIA partners, the Academic Partnership Engagement Experiment, also known as APEX, and the Doolittle Institute. Um, if you aren't familiar with PIAs, they're partnership intermediary agreements. We are nonprofit institutions, including universities, that serve as an intermediary between institutions in academia, labs, industry, and our government sponsor, in this case, AFRL. So you'll hear about PS throughout the morning. Um, in the first half of the morning, you'll hear about opportunities, get tips, and learn about resources when applying for funding from the government. And during the second half, you'll hear from organizations that can provide you more support throughout the AFRL ecosystem, including transitioning your research. You'll also hear a real account of researchers from Adranos who have successfully navigated the system and transitioned their work to the commercial sector. So I'll give a little information about the BRIC before we get started. At the BRIC, we offer an environment and suite of services that foster meaningful and impactful initiatives and engagement opportunities to further the overall AFOSR mission of finding and funding revolutionary basic science. At the BRIC, we are powered by Virginia Tech Applied Research Corporation, and we are a nonprofit affiliated with Virginia Tech. We're located in Arlington, Virginia, and we provide support to AFOSR through providing a collaborative space, data analytics, technology transfer support, 
workforce development and outreach. Um, and at our facility, we host over 2,000 visitors a year from academia, industry, government, and from around the world. Our mission is to collaborate to innovate, learn from data, support AFOSR's unique technology transformation, and develop and enhance the workforce. So we support the workforce through events like this. We aim to promote information sharing that will enhance AFOSR's mission for basic science and to inform universities, small businesses, and other organizations about how to work with AFOSR through partnerships and funding. So events like these are so important because they're wide reaching and give interested organizations opportunities to ask questions. So part of today's focus is providing information pathways to funding opportunities on how to work with AFRL. So this infographic describes the AFOSR research ecosystem in a nutshell. AFOSR program officers develop a portfolio of basic science to, to aid the, the warfighter by funding researchers at research institutions. And these can be in academia, additional labs, and with industry. This research produces scientific publications, the next generation of scientists and engineers, spurs inventions, and provides opportunities for commercialization and licensing. So all of these have effects on the transition and transfer of technology. The knowledge transfer creates a body of knowledge that inspires innovations, either directly or over the course of the maturity of the research field. And sometimes people trained under AFOSR funding go on to lead their own research projects and start companies such as Adranos, who you'll hear from later. So here's a snippet about PIAs. PIAs increase the likelihood of success in the conduct of cooperative or joint activities with small business firms, institutions of higher education and industry. So as a PIA partner, the BRIC provides support at each level of this process through learning from data, cultivating partnerships and sharing information. So for more information about PIAs, the BRIC and our capabilities, feel free to contact us. So we hope you enjoy today's event and leave having learned something new. Now, Matthew Bigman, today's facilitator, will give a few short housekeeping tips and then we will hear from our first speaker. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Bigman. I'm one of the lead research analysts here at VT ARC and I'm going to be facilitator for today's meeting. Just for some general housekeeping, I want to please request everyone remain on mute for the duration of the meeting, unless you're one of our speakers. We're going to have a lot of people in the room today and we don't need a cacophony of voices in the background. This event will be recorded and the recording will be made available at a later date. Please ask all your questions in the Zoom or YouTube chat. Our team of moderators will be collecting your questions for us to ask the participants at the end of their respective Q&A sessions. And all slides and information from the presenters will also be available on our APAN site. But first, I wanted to start with a quick overview of today's speakers. So we have today Dr. Bindu Nair, Director for the DOD Basic Research Office, Dr. Nair oversees, coordinates, and develops policy for over $2.5 billion in investment. Colonel Michelle Evie, the Deputy Director of AFOSR, Colonel Evie ensures the success of about $500 million a year in basic research investment and transitioning that basic research to other parts of Air Force research laboratories. Mr. Calvin Scott is a senior procurement analyst at AFOSR. Major Jared Evans is a team member of AFWorks and is an operations team member focusing on transition at AFOSR. Ms. Mary Margaret Evans will be our lead APEX speaker today. She has over 20 years of experience managing major projects like this. Ms. Caroline Fries is the director of the Doolittle Institute and AFRL Innovation Institute serving the Munitions Directorate on Eagle and Air Force Base. She's an engineer, serial entrepreneur, and community leader. And our final speakers for the day will be Brandon Terry and Stephen Colburn. Dr. Brandon Ter Terry is the chief technology officer of Adranos and co-founder. 
where he leads technology development efforts. Mr. Govern is the Vice President of Business Development and Strategy, and he's leading the effort to commercialize some of Adrano's efforts. But now I want to hand it over to a quick introduction from Dr. Welsh. Dr. Welsh is the current director of Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the aforementioned AFOSR, here in Arlington, Virginia. She leads the management of over 200 staff at locations ranging from Tokyo, Japan to Santiago, Chile, and manages the United States Air Force's Global Basic Research Investment Funds. Welcome, Dr. Welsh. Great, can you hear me and can you see me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> There's always that issue with the equipment, right? So good morning, everyone. Um, I am so excited, uh, first of all, to be the new director for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, uh, dream job. So I've been on board for uh, several weeks. So brand new. So I've actually, you know, never uh, uh, sat through um, one of these. Um, so I'm really excited about today and excited about the, the job and the opportunities it presents. So um, first, thank you to our partner, uh, The Brick, for hosting. The Brick is the Basic Research Collab uh, Innovation and Collaboration Center. I always have to look at that acronym. Um, thank you so much for hosting. And uh, thank you all for attending. We're going to have about several hundred people on this webinar today, so I'm super excited about that. We have a number of Air Force and Department of Defense senior leaders, as well as congressional staff in the audience today, as uh, Matthew alluded to, and, and introduced some of those folks. We have some familiar faces from academia and industry who have worked with us and continue to work with us to support the Air Force S&T mission. So thank you for that. And then finally, um, we also are very excited about the 40% um, of you who will uh, let us know, uh, who have let us know that you are new to the Air Force Research Lab research ecosystem. So welcome. I understand about, I think the stats are actually about 85% of the folks today on this webinar have never done business uh, with this before. So that is very exciting for um, AFOSR. Um, we have a very long history of working with university research community on breakthrough science um, that's extremely important to the Department of the Air Force, um, which includes U.S. Air Force and Space Force. And um, this event and our ongoing partnership with the BRIC enables us to provide information connecting you to our Air Force Office of Scientific Research Opportunities, um, as well as those in the broader Air Force Research Lab research um, ecosystem. So to set the stage a little bit for us today, um, over the next few hours, as uh, Matthew had mentioned, you're gonna learn about many opportunities to engage with the Air Force Research Lab research ecosystem. Um, my hope is that you take away from this event that there are people and processes in place uh, to help you connect to those opportunities. And some of the speakers will give you a micro look and some will give you a macro look at both why and how um, the Air Force Research Lab invest in these relationship, um, relationships that are so, that are a cross section of the government, academia and industry. So their perspectives will shed some light on where you can see yourself in our ecosystem. And then you'll also see some examples of how this process works in action and what success can, um, what success can look like um, uh, working with us. So we know historically that navigating uh, the Air Force Research Lab uh, ecosystem can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, just know that we know that. And across AFRL, we're working very hard on a number of ways to make it easier for you to work with us. And that, of course, processes take time. Um, but we've instituted um, a few processes that we're going to hopefully that will hopefully make it easier for you um, in the beginning. And that will only get better as time goes on. At the heart of this event is linking our Department of Defense, universities, and industry science and technology partners in support of national defense. That's why, that's why we're here. So with that, I am very happy to um, introduce Dr. Bindu Nair. She is the uh, Director for Basic Research Directorate um, in the Office of the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering and in the Department of Defense. Um, even just over the last several weeks that I've been on board, she's already become a huge supporter and ally, and I so appreciate that. 
Uh, Dr. Nair oversees and coordinates and develops policy um, for the Department of Defense $2.5 billion investment in revolutionary scientific ideas and runs uh, supporting programs such as the Multidisciplinary University Research Initiative called the Murray, um, the Defense University Research Instrumentation Program called DURAP, and the Vannevar Bursch Faculty Fellowship the defense established a program to stimulate competitive research and many others. Um, Dr. Nair drives the direction of the Department of Defense basic research investments, uh, coordinates and conducts oversight of all the Department of Defense basic research programs um, and is a huge help for us I know in that capacity and is improving the science and engineering workforce and public outreach. Um, additionally, she is charged with enhancing university industry collaboration and engaging um, with the academic research community globally. So I am happy to introduce Dr. Bindu Nair as your sp first speaker for today. So uh, welcome, Dr. Nair. Hi, Sherry, thank you so very much. And thank you all, um, thank you to the Air Force for inviting um, um, the Office of the Secretary of Defense to come talk, you know, join your event. This is such a um, great and uh, great idea. So Sherry, thank you for that. And uh, thank you to the BRIC for putting this on. Um, I think that connecting with the Department of Defense can be complicated. And so I am more than happy to share with you um, some thoughts about that. Um, take, take advantage of these kind of activities, um, you know, because it isn't the same as writing a proposal to NSF or writing a proposal to the NIH. Um, it does look different, um, how to engage with the Department of Defense. And so um, get to know us, get to know how to become part of our ecosystem. And I think you'll find that the rewards to you both scientifically, as well as um, providing goods and services to the Department of Defense are gonna be, um, most of our principal investigators find that incredibly satisfying. So we hope you enjoy um, becoming part of our enterprise. So as Sherry said, I look over the basic research enterprise. So that is the um, two and a half billion dollars that we invest as a department in early science. And so this chart here that you see is um, what is basic research within the context of the Department of Defense. And when we talk about uh, context of the Defense Department, we do different kinds of research. We do stuff that's basic, which is what I'm gonna be talking about. But today you're gonna to hear a little bit about um, 6.2 or applied research as well as advanced technology development. Those three buckets, 6.1, 6.2 and 6.3 are what we call science and technology and university partners play in all of those. And AFRL can take you through how the Air Force engages all of that. What I am going to be talking about today really is that bottom, which is 6.1. And a lot of people don't appreciate that we do this open exploratory research that is not tied to a specific application at the time of conception. And we do. And we think that that's a very important thing that we do. Um, and I am here to tell you a little bit about that and talk about um, how AFOSR and other parts of the DOD play into that, how we, how we um, use that investment that Congress makes in us. Okay, going on to the next chart. So when we think about basic research, why does the DOD fund basic research? Why can't we wait for somebody like NSF or other science funding agencies whose job it is in the country to build out basic research for us? So why, why do we go ahead? Why does the DOD fund this? Well, here's a, a chart from um, a, yeah, some, some of you have read a book called, uh, from, by, um, called Pastor's Quadrant from uh, Daniel Stokes. And he sort of posits one way to look at the research enterprise. So if on the y-axis you have, how fundamental is the question? And on the um, x-axis you have, how useful or how known usefulness is it right now, right? And you sort of like put research into those quadrants. What you have is um, over in uh, the Bohr quadrant is this pure basic research, which is, why does, a, um, why does an electron do what it does? Why does a quark do what it does? Why does a neuron do what it does? Following the fundamentals of nature. And we do an awful lot of that because we want to eventually be able to, to engineer and, and mess with that, right? But I wanna draw your attention to this use-inspired research quadrant, which is what we call the Pasteur quadrant. 
So if you think about the Pasteur quadrant, what we think about is, you know, there was that, um, the, the, the example that the Pasteur's quadrant book uses is this concept of having, um, you know, a young Louis Pasteur, he's out in the field, he's trying to figure out, um, you know, he's been hired, he's, he's a young chemist, he's been hired by the winemakers, and he's trying to figure out what is the gunk at the bottom of um, the wine merchant's barrels, right? So that's what he's working on. That's the problem that's been, um, that he's been um, given to him. And he does something with it that, you know, there's multiple ways you can attack that problem. You can do an engineering solution. You can try to scrub off the stuff that's collecting at the bottom of the winemaker's barrel, making the stuff sour, right? So you can do it that way. Or you can do the kind of work that Pasteur did, which really went into trying to understand the why why is this stuff falling out? What's going on? What are the processes? And from that, he creates something that is much bigger than the original problem set, right? So we start off with this question of wine and winemakers, and we end up with germ theory. And that's kind of why we fund use-inspired research, because we in the Department of Defense have a whole host of incredibly complex and incredibly meaningful problems for you to look at. We're not asking in the basic research space for you to do an engineering solution necessarily, although sometimes we will ask for that, but we're asking for the problems to inspire you to think bigger and broader because sometimes, as you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So we are providing you the necessary tools and what we're hoping is that you break all of our roadmaps and you provide us different ways of solving the problem than we had ever considered before. And you solve problems bigger than the ones we've considered before, which is why you see so much of DOD in so many of the major inventions um, that are coming out in the country because we're part of all of that. And our problems inspire you to think bigger than just the problem itself. Um, we also do applied research, the Edisonian Quadrant, and our laboratories um, do a lot of that. AFRL is very much a part of that. Um, and our 6-2 program, some of which you, we ask for engagement with the universities, goes more into that, uh, into that direction. So moving on to the next chart, um, if, we can, if we can look at this, when you look at that $2.5 billion that we spend, um, here's, how, here's how it sort of plays out. You know, you have the Army, Navy, and Air Force. I'm sorry, the Air Force's uh, label didn't show up on the here. But, um, you know, sort of roughly equivalently spaced in, um, in, um, in, in the 6-1 enterprise, or the basic research enterprise. And they will be talking to you today about how to access some parts of the Air Force part of that, um, of that 6-1. However, the Army and Navy, of course, are, are eager and ready to partner with universities in the same way. So I encourage you, um, to also look at what they're asking for. Um, DARPA, um, across all of their, uh, of their offices, spends a, a big part of our 6-1 budget too. We, in the, um, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, we hold a little bit of that money, but we're not really a program office. That's not our job. Our job is to like coordinate, help these folks, be their advocate as they're spending the 6-1, and then also become a, um, a conduit between academia and the Department of Defense um, as needed. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those programs, but I don't think that's the point. The point here is that the services are the ones that have the intimate understanding of the problem set. And so while we make sure that we're continuing to do very good science, the job of the program officers in each of these services is to translate those questions into things, into problems for you to be able to think about via the Pasteur Quadrant. That's really the heart of what basic research does. This is why you need to get to know your program manager and you need to get to know the service and the needs of the service. There's a little bit more legwork up front, but if you don't do that, you're not taking advantage of the fullness of what <clears throat> the, the, the problem sets that the department can offer you so you can be creative and, um, and do the kind of work that you want to do. Okay, we're the major funder of basic research in math, physics, and engineering, and we are the third largest funder of basic research to universities. I think that's important to know. All right, going on to the next chart. Um, if you look at the areas that are funded out of DOD, 
um, we are the primary uh, funders of computer science, engineering, um, and math and statistics um, as bucketed by the National Science Board um, in when we look at when we look at areas. We are a heavy funder in physical science and then we have some investments in other things and we can talk a little bit about those. If you look at the research budget by federal agencies, which is that pie uh, chart on, on the left, what you will see is that um, we are the second largest funder um, to universities or to academia. Um, obviously the big, the big dog here is the medical research community and HHS, but following behind that is actually DOD. If you look at not just the basic research, but basic research all the way up to other activities that we ask for support from the university community. And you are here to learn about how to participate in that. Okay, moving on to the next chart. So when we look at basic research investments across the DOD, we do a bunch of different things, right? And you'll hear about many of these pieces as you listen to AFRL. We certainly do some pre-doctoral fellowships. Um, we, we do um, the National Defense uh, Science and Engineering Graduate Program. You have the SMART program. You have all kinds of programs that are helping us with the research end of people as they are learning how to participate in the research ecosystem. We certainly do a lot of research. A big chunk of that change of that two and a half billion dollars is research funding to laboratory, uh, to the university laboratories. So um, that will happen, you know, both internally, externally, but also uh, to, um, and here we, I've listed out several of the things. If you look in the um, purple, those are things that really are, uh, that, that my office for the most part runs right now. But, you know, if you look at the MURI, that is a coordinated program. The services, meaning Air Force in this case, comes up with the topics, figures their program officers, figure out what we want to ask of the community, but it's managed, um, you know, we, we cross level it across the department um, through my office, for example. But again, part of that MURI topic belongs in the services and belongs to the program officers at AFOSR. So you should get to know the program officer. Um, the services like um, Air, the Air Force will run single investigator awards. You'll hear more about that. They have the young investigator program. They have a bunch of different programs and they'll talk to you about how they spend that 500 million dollars that uh, Sherry was talking about. The next thing that we do is we expand the research base. We want to try to figure out how to reach people that we don't traditionally reach as much. So we have an HBCUMI program. We have a, a depth score program. So that's for states that aren't um, as, as invested in DOD research. How do we, how do we access those folks? And then, um, and then the last thing, uh, and then we talk about the equipment um, and facility funding, that is DURF, again, run by the program officers. So get to know your program officers, even though it's managed um, at the OSD level. We have questions about how to transition um, stuff out of the basic research into the DOD, and we'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that. And then we talk about transferring outside of the DOD uh, to, this, to, the, to the private sector, and that, that's, a, that's an area that we're working on a lot. Okay, moving on to the next chart. I am not going to spend a lot of time on these, that you have the charts, you can, you can go through them. These are just some of the ongoing programs uh, for, you, for you to read and, have, and familiarize yourself with as you desire. I'll quickly run through a couple of them. If we go to the next chart. Um, the Veneva Bush Faculty Fellowship, that is the single investigator, the sort of flagship single investigator program in the Department of Defense. This is where we give you a bunch of money um, and not a whole lot of um, handholding in order to produce transformation. So we, we, we find you based on your um, right ideas um, and your, your track record of, uh, of, of sustained um, activity as a researcher. And then we ask you, what would you wanna do if you changed the field? And it is an incredibly uh, rich experience. I encourage you guys to think about when, when you might want to apply for a VBF there. Moving on to the next chart. Um, I'm going to skip through that. Yeah, I'm going to skip through these. These are just how you do that. Laboratory University Collaboration Initiative. If you are a MUR API or a VBFF, we ask you to partner with our researchers in the laboratories. So the AFRL laboratories 
will have people that are partnered with some of these um, leading researchers in order to pull some of those academic concepts into a more military relevant problem set. It's a great program and we have a bunch of very active um, AFRL Lucy fellows. Moving on to the next chart. Uh, Minerva is a social science project and um, Again, you can read about this. I'm not going to spend any time on this. Moving on to the next chart. The Multi-University Research Initiative. Again, this is the project, or these are the programs that are funded by um, the uh, services, but managed um, as a tri-service activity. And this is a great thing that I think that the Department of Defense does. These MIRIs are small team-based ideas. When a program officer in, the, in AFOSR or a bunch of other folks um, decide to pull together, right, um, to ask a problem of the, the community and ask you to build teams, interdisciplinary teams to do this. This has been going on since about the 80s. And we find that MIRIs do two things. First, it really sparks innovation. We think some of our most creative ideas are coming from um, the MIRI program. And the second thing it does is um, it, it ties you closer to the problem sets of the DOD. Um, and sometimes it allows us to either fund a field that, has, that needs a sort of um, a, a strong amount of push at that particular time. So we're very proud of the MIRI program and um, we encourage you to look at the, the MIRI activities. If you are ever asked to be part of a MIRI team, please join them because usually you'll have a principal MIRI investigator, and then you'll have a bunch of folks that will participate as uh, co-PIs. And a lot of times we find that new people into the ecosystem come in as co-PIs with somebody who's already sort of figured out how to work the department's processes. Skip over this chart because you can see the times. Um, NDSEG, we talked about the graduate fellowship. If you have students that um, are, uh, and this is a, this requires a US citizenship, if you have students that are part, that are um, really high quality students, we encourage you to send them um, to apply for the NDSCG fellowship to support their researchers, um, their, their, their learning how to become researchers by our PhD program. Moving on to the next chart. Um, that's again, just the uh, application timeline going on to the next chart. HBCUMI. Um, we are trying very hard to figure out how to expand the the STEM workforce and looking at how um, other people can participate in this, um, in this, in this program. And um, so we have some examples of HBCU MIs um, partnering with folks that are maybe not in HBCU MIs to pull some of these ideas forward. Um, so you, again, I encourage you to read this chart going on to the next chart. Um, okay. So beyond funding research, I think that I do want to, to close out with a couple of thoughts. Moving on to the next chart. We do a lot of policy work and I don't know if it's relevant to you as a principal investigator sitting in the audience as much, but we do try to figure out how to help with the research ecosystem. We connect back to the federal, um, the, the rest of the federal funding family to make sure that we are doing things that sort of support the broader federal funding goals. We represent and promote basic research within the department and figure out how to um, maintain the ability for places like AFOSR to really push into the future in, in ways that are transformative. Because as you might imagine, we tend to have, a, a, like everybody else, people are looking for immediate solutions. So it takes a lot of discipline for us to be able to maintain this investment into the future. And we, um, Sherry, myself, others, are that voice within the department and we try very hard to do that so that we can continue to get you to bring forward um, great ideas. Um, engage with the interagency. I think these are there are some very important policy issues that we're working on right now that I think are going to set the future of how uh, research works in the country. And we, we certainly spend time on that. And, um, and uh, research security, you heard a little bit about that, I'm sure. Um, and this is not the time to talk about that, but um, it, is, it is something that the DOD takes very seriously because we believe in this open research environment. We think that is 
fundamental to the ideas that are coming forward, but we have to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And how we balance that and manage that um, is, uh, is certainly something that we are evolving as we speak. All right, going on to the next chart. Um, I just wanted to um, thank the Air Force for giving me a chance to come and just chat with you about basic research as a whole. Um, I think that it is, uh, um, it, is, it, it, is, it is frankly the best part in my mind of working for the DOD. It's just, you know, you get to do both cool science and connect it um, inspired by the needs of um, our nation's military. So thank you for listening and I will turn it back over to Matthew. Thank you very much, Dr. Nair. Next, we have Colonel Avi, Deputy Director of AFOSR. Thank you very much, Matthew. And thank you as well to Dr. Nair for, for sharing about the DOD level basic research. So I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. I'd like you all to take a moment and think about your own research. Think about the research you might like to do but haven't started yet. Or if you run an institution, think about the work that's done there. Then I'm gonna ask you to indulge me a little bit take a look at this fantastic creature on the screen and join me in considering how this stomapod, your research, and the Department of the Air Force are related. And we're going to consider this by taking a little mental vacation. Um, I'm guessing most of you, after some really rough months that our country has had, that the world has had, would like to take a vacation, but unfortunately for most of us, it's just not feasible right now. So we're gonna take a mental vacation. So start by visualizing, and, and here is the scene if, if you need some help, visualizing your favorite tropical location. And then let's imagine we're there. It's a beautiful day. The sun is warm. There's a light breeze. You can smell the salt and maybe a little sunscreen in the air. The sand is really soft beneath your toes. You kind of walk to the water's edge and test it out. Bath, water warm. And you decide it's a good day to go snorkeling and visit that reef that you've heard is just off, off the beach. So you grab your equipment, go into the shallows, Put on your fins, your mask, your snorkel, and away you go, heading out towards the reef, leisurely swimming. And as you head out there, get closer, you see some brain coral, you see some stag horn coral, the sea fans are blowing gently in the currents. As you get a little bit closer, you see a clownfish hiding within an anemone. You stay away from, this, from the urchins, knowing that they could, they could cause some trouble. You notice the angelfish and the butterfly fish pecking at the reef. And you just swim along and enjoy. And then suddenly, out of the corner of your eye, you notice a violent scattering of some sand on the reef. You kind of take it back and then you go in for a closer look. And what you see, next slide, is a pair of these odd creatures that look like they're attacking each other, smacking each other on the back with these clubs in the front, very violently, tossing up the sand, shuttling back and forth. You've never seen anything like it. It's beautiful, but in sort of a violent way. So. At this point, you watch them, they kind of, they don't seem to be hurt or damaged. They, they shuttle away back into the reef. And you decide it's time to head back to the shore. So taking your time, enjoying the weather, head back to the shore, get up to the beach, dry off, maybe get yourself a fruity beverage, and then pull out your phone and start to do a little bit of research. You want to figure out what those were and what they were doing. And it doesn't take you too long to discover that those were mantis shrimp. 
And what they were probably doing was ritualized fighting. And those particular ones, because they were using their front clubs, are called smashers. And believe it or not, those smashers can accelerate at the same speed as a 22 caliber bullet, 200 pounds of pressure, I think. And yet they didn't seem damaged. So you do a little bit more research and you come across a paper, 2009 paper published by David Casalis out of the University of California at Riverside. And interestingly enough, you notice it's funded by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And you think to yourself, the Air Force, maybe the Navy makes sense, but why is the Air Force funding this? So you read a little bit more of the article and you actually find a Smithsonian article that, that quotes Dr. Casalis talking about the research. And what he's discovered is in the back end of those mantis shrimp are these things called telsons. They're kind of like shields. And the microstructure he has discovered underneath those shields are helicoid. So imagine taking this, this is what works for me. Imagine taking a piece of plywood kind of from the top and then twisting it in counter directions. So you get a helical structure. And what he's discovered is because of those helical structure, when those mantis shrimp are hit with such forces upon their back, it's actually able to absorb and dampen that force as well as help mitigate cracks that might form. And in this article that you read, he mentions that this microstructure and understanding that and how to exploit it in composite materials could be useful for anything where you need reduced weight, but increased strength and toughness. And he specifically calls out aerospace materials. And so now it makes a little bit more sense why the Air Force would be funding research on mantis shrimp. So with that, you put down your phone and decide to enjoy the sun, lay back, and maybe you think about how your research and what you do might also have long-term applications for the Air Force. So with that, let's jump in. Next slide. I wanna tell you a little bit about who we are as an organization and how obviously you can connect. So, Air Force Office of Scientific Research is part of the Air Force Research Laboratory, the larger organization, which is the primary scientific research and development center for the Air Force. It was originally founded in 1918 and called the McCook site. It was the largest engineering experimental site in the US at that time. Um, now our headquarters are still at Wright-Patterson Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. We have a workforce of about 11,000. Our annual budget is about $2.5 billion a year. And next slide. And we're located, whoops, go back. We're located in nine different states. So the Air Force Research Lab is made up of what we call nine technical directorates. And each one of these technical directorates you can see in the, in the blue squares have a particular focus area of research that they're interested in, a discipline, and they're located all over the US. However, we as AFOSR are a little bit different. At each of the other eight technical directorates, they actually accomplish research. There are researchers who are doing research in laboratories there, doing research from basic research up through applied and advanced research. So what Dr. Nair talked about, 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. However, we at AFOSR are a little bit different. We don't do any research. Rather, we are the sole stewards of the Air Force's 6-1 or basic research funding. So we are located in Arlington, Virginia. We're in a fantastic, there we go, fantastic location. We're in Arlington, Virginia. We're in the same building as the Office of Naval Research. We are one block away from DARPA. We are a metro right away from the National Science Foundation and the National Academies of Sciences. So we're, we're in a really great place, have a great ecosystem of uh, basic research and, and s and organizations. In addition to being in Arlington, Virginia, which is where our main office is, we also have offices in London, United Kingdom, Tokyo, Japan, Santiago, Chile, 
and we're getting ready this coming year to open up a new office along with the other parts of the Air Force Research Lab in Melbourne, Australia. And we anticipate in the coming years potentially opening another location in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Because we all know that great research, great science doesn't necessarily come just from the United States. So we want to make sure that we're looking there as well. Next slide, please. So this is how we work. We find, we form, we fund, and we forward. Uh, Dr. Nair mentioned this, but we as a basic research organization within the DOD, but as the Air Force specifically, we are different than the other basic research funding organizations such as NSF because we are interested in finding research that can one day potentially benefit the needs of the Department of the Air Force, so the Air Force and the Space Force. And we do that by enabling program officers. At our Arlington office, we have 36, and then we have international program officers throughout the globe at the locations I mentioned. We give them a huge amount of autonomy. We hire them and bring them on board because they are subject matter experts in their field. They know where the science needs to go. They have great networks throughout their discipline and we give them a huge amount of autonomy to find the science that makes sense for the Air Force to fund. Even if we only have an inkling of an idea of how it may help in the future, we give our program officers the autonomy to figure that out and help shape that science. And that's the next, that's the form. So they have the autonomy and the budget to reach out and find the university researchers that can help support where they see the science in their area needs to go. To give you an idea of sort of the scope, on an annual basis, we fund about 1,200 what we call extramural research projects. That just means outside the Air Force, so at universities. And we also fund research at uh, what we call intramural research at the other AFR, AFRL technical directorate. So we do fund some basic research at AFRL as well. And then, of course, we have multiple, multiple international efforts in 43 countries, which I'll touch up towards the end. But what it all comes down to is helping transition basic research into capabilities for the Air Force. And one of the ways that we do this is by using small business innovative research and small business technology transfer programs. And you'll hear about that a little bit later today. Um, but that's also why you'll see we do try to link up the other eight technical directorates with the research that we fund at universities so that there can be a pathway for transition. We also acknowledge that sometimes the results from basic research we don't see for decades. So part of, part of our challenge is to balance funding that discovery research, that Boar's Quadrant research, with the Pasteur's Quadrant that maybe we can see the transition a little bit more readily. But we are absolutely open to both. Next slide, please. Here are some of the examples of funding opportunities. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, Dr. Nair mentioned some of them. The ones in blue are the OSD basic research programs. The ones in black are the programs that we fund with our Air Force core funding. We as an organization, as AFOSR, we have approximately $500 million a year in funding to put out for the goodness of science. About 350 million of it is what we call core Air Force funding. It comes straight from the Air Force. And then the other 150 million does come from OSD and supports those programs you see in blue. I'm just gonna touch on um, a couple of them and then we'll move on. I mentioned extramural grants, not quite yet. There we go. I mentioned extramural grants. They are the grants that we fund at universities. In the middle column, summer faculty fellowships. These are important uh, because they give university faculty and graduate students an opportunity to come work at one of the technical directorates at the Air Force Research Lab for the summer. 
So it helps build those networks and build those connections and potentially sets up transition pathways. And then lastly, to the on the very, very right under workforce development, I just want to mention Windows on the World. This is a program that we support that allows US researchers to go out and spend time in international research institutions, usually short periods of time, six months, a year, uh, sometimes also to, to go support um, attending conferences. But it is one of the programs that is probably the least well known. Next slide, please. This is a very top level view of some of the focus areas of the research that we go out and look for. So I'll let you take a quick look here and get an idea of maybe where your research falls. And then next slide. These are the 36 basic research portfolios that our program officers oversee. So each one of these has a program officer associated with it. And you can see it's quite diverse, everything from low density materials to computational mathematics, to remote sensing. And uh, I wanted to mention natural materials and systems specifically because that is the program that uh, was that funded the multi-university research initiative that spun out the mantis shrimp research. So that's run by Dr. Ora Gim. So you have some frame of reference for that. And then you see on the right, of course, we have our international offices and our international program officers fund um, diverse portfolios as well. And they work really hard to link the research that they support up in the international community with the technical directorates. Next slide, please. All right, where do we fund? Well, here in the US, this, these are the, the um, number of projects by state and the total amount of funding by state for FY 2019 or calendar year 2018, 2019. The top number is the number of projects. The next number down is the total amount for that particular year funded. And then underneath that is the total amount for the lifetime of a grant in, that started in this case, FY19. So typical grants are around 200K plus, could be as much as 500K a year. Typically grants are awarded for about three years, but there's a lot of flexibility in those numbers. Next slide, please. I also wanted to mention our centers of excellence. I talked about the Summer Faculty Fellowship Program. This is, this is where um, that program often gets used. So our centers of excellence are programs where we combine efforts with one of the technical directorates or a couple of the technical directorates. We have a particular topic of interest. It's uh, an area that we feel and that the technical director feels needs some really good focus. There's a broad agency announcement put out on that particular topic. And then AFOSR will fund the university's basic research funding, 6-1 funding, approximately 500K a year for three years. And then the Air Force Research Lab Technical Directorate will fund the 6-2 work at that technical directorate. And part of uh, the goal is to really link up the university researchers and the researchers at the technical directorate to build that collaboration, to build those communities, and when appropriate, maybe even help transition some of the graduate students into the Air Force workforce. So our newest one just came on board in FY20. It's overseen by our program officer, Jamie Tilley, and the organization at uh, the technical directorate is the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate at AFRL. Next slide, please. So hopefully you've gotten a little bit of an idea how, um, how diverse the program can be. But I just wanna emphasize that our program officers, because they create these collaborations and these communities around their particular discipline, pulling in universities, pulling in other DOD agencies, other government agencies, really creates this beautiful network and a lot of synergy. 
Matter of fact, many of our program officers will co-host their annual program review with one of the other services. So even builds on that community even more and brings people together who maybe wouldn't have a chance to communicate and rally around their discipline otherwise. And lastly, next slide please. It's not just about being in the US. As I mentioned, we have our three international officer offices, soon to be four and maybe five. And our international program officers fund basic research that we believe will benefit the Air Force at one point in time all across the globe. Here you see the 43 countries that in FY19 we funded projects in. You see the names of the countries listed and then next to them are the number of projects at each of the country that were funded in each of the countries. So just really phenomenal work and phenomenal relationships come out of these uh, projects and the, the funding out of our international offices. Um, and as a way of a clunky transition, I'm going to point out that we do fund research in Sweden. And of course, Stockholm is where the Nobel Prizes are presented. Uh, and so here you see our slide listing as of 2019, the 82 Nobel Prize laureates that AFOSR has helped fund. On average, we have funded them 17 years before their Nobel Prize. So we take great pride in the fact that our program officers see great researchers and know great science when they see it and are able to help push science forward. And you'll see in the very bottom, bottom right, our most recent award winner was John B. Goodenow. Next slide. So Dr. Goodenow actually has a, a little bit of a history with the, with the Air Force. In World War II, he was a meteorologist for the Army Air Force. And after he finished his stint there, he went on to finish his PhD in physics at the University of Chicago, spent some time at MIT Lincoln Labs. And then in 1976, took a professorship at the University of Oxford in London. And while he was there, AFOSR, the London office, noticed the work that he was doing, and he received a grant from 1978 to 1981 for the work that he did, his seminal work that he did in lithium cobalt oxide cathodes. Next slide. So shown here are the excerpts from his original paper and his seminal work. And you'll notice AFOSR funded them. So we take great pride in the fact that we help support him. And I'm gonna finish on this note. So as you know, lithium ion batteries are ubiquitous and without a doubt has changed the way our world works. So I ask tonight when you go home and you get ready to plug your, your charger into your cell phone, you maybe take a moment and think about how AFOSR played a small role in that creation of that technology. And then maybe pause for a moment more and think about how maybe your research and the Air Force could open a dialogue so that we can continue to push that cutting edge basic research, that discovery research into new transformational capabilities. So thank, thank you. Thank very you very much, much Colonel Avey. And thank you for your time. Um, we're running a little bit behind right now, so but we should still have plenty of time for questions and answer session at the end of all of our AFOSR presentations. At this time, I'm going to share a little video before we go on to the next speaker. Hopefully my computer sound will play for you all. So you want to par partner with the Air Force Research Laboratory, AFR. RL leads the discovery, development, and delivery of air, space, and cyber technologies for the United States Air Force. We partner with academia, small businesses, industry, and internal Air Force organizations and individuals to help bring their ideas to life. 
we connect our academic partners with the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, AFOSR, to collaborate on topics such as materials, synthetic biology, hypersonics, space, quantum, and more. These connections can lead to grants and partnership opportunities for basic research. Applying for basic research funding is a simple three-step process. Step one, go to grants.gov, the official source for finding and applying to federal grants to review broad agency announcements, BAAs, from AFOSR and all other organizations. Search for opportunities that match your interests, find your niche, and draft an idea statement. Step two, connect with an AFOSR program officer from the BAA to discuss your idea. They'll work with you to determine eligibility and the best funding opportunity from among traditional grants, university research initiatives, or special programs. Step three, submit your full proposal on grants.gov to get your idea funded. If you don't get funded the first time, rescope and try again. So what are you waiting for? Connect and learn more at afresearchlab.com. So you want to all right, thank you very much. And with that, we are next going straight to Mr. Calvin Scott, a Senior Procurement Analyst at AF Basic Research, who will be going into more details of the video you just saw. Mr. Calvin Scott. Uh, good morning. Um, as Matt stated, my name is Calvin Scott. I'm the Senior Procurement Analyst for AF4SR. I'm responsible for overall management of the AF4SR Open BAA. Um, often, uh, this role kind of consists of serving as the bridge between the program officers and the principal investigators. All right, we can go to the next slide. Today we'll be discussing how to improve your overall competitiveness with AFOSR. Uh, you know, the illustration here you'll you'll see um, it's it's pretty uh, direct. It's you want to first review the BAA reach out to the program officer based on your review of the BAA and provide a short statement or a short idea statement, which is commonly referred to as a white paper. Um, lastly, you wanna submit a full um, proposal via grants.gov. Um, all right, next slide. All right, if you are new to the, if you're new to the grant submission process, we encourage you to consider attending grant writing courses. Um, AFOSR um, considers good proposals to include strong technical merit, uh, Air Force relevance, and a strong budget justification. All right, and if we go to the next slide. In regards to understanding um, the funding considerations, RPOs, consider several factors when choosing which proposals to fund. Some are, are the connection to the program interests uh, in DOD labs, potential breakthroughs, peer review uh, recommendations. Um, and these are just some of the considerations. And okay, uh, we should be on slide five, back, us, back two slides. Yes, okay, um, Colonel, uh, uh, Colonel Avey and Dr. Nair uh, talked about forging partnerships. Uh, I wanna, uh, I guess, dive a little deeper into that. You can forge partnerships by attending program reviews and collaborating with other PIs that have experience with the Air Force in our granting process. Uh, as they as they all stated, we have um, several opportunities uh, via open, you know, our open BAAs as well as our closed BAAs. The Center of Excellence is a great opportunity. Um, and I saw a question about um, eligibility pop up, but I think we'll answer that. Uh, when we get to the Q&A part. All right, and the next slide. All right, all right, so this, this slide illustrates the Air Force granting process. 
Now, the proposals are submitted via grants.gov. They're reviewed by the POs and sent out for scientific peer reviews. If the proposals are selected for funding, then uh, cost and technical evaluation is completed and is forwarded for funding. Um, then it comes to our contracting team, uh, which reviews the proposal to ensure that it's in accordance with the BAA, as well as the um, DOD grant regulations. Um, if there are any questions, the contracting personnel will reach out to clarify. And lastly, the award is, of course, sent to the university and the research starts, which is the most exciting part. All right. The next slide, please. And so Colonel A.B. and Dr. Nair, again, also touched on this, so I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to waste any time on, on this slide. I think they've covered pretty much everything. Uh, I just want to encourage you to make sure that you're checking grants.gov regularly because that is our primary uh, primary site for posting research and development solicitations. All right. Um, so one thing I wanted to foot stomp on is we want to make sure that you guys are reaching out early and often to the program offices as this is going to be the most important uh, way to collaborate and have an understanding of what the Air Force is looking for and kind of how our funding cycles will work. Uh, that's all for me. I have, I think we should have some time for questions and I have myself and Eric Peterson, who's a branch chief and Julie, who's gonna be assisting with um, answering any questions you guys may have. And we'll be saving all the questions for the end of the uh, morning AFOSR presentations. I believe our last speaker for this morning is Major Jared Evans, a uh, partner at AF Ventures and the technology transition lead for AFOSR. Major Evans. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, are you able to, to read me okay? Yep. We can hear you. Excellent. Very good. Very good. So thank you so much for uh, for your time this morning. Um, a lot of wonderful presentations thus far. Uh, we want to build on that with uh, talk about some of our small business programs, which is kind of the commercialization side of the process. So you've gone through the process of, of um, uh, receiving a grant and you've seen the, the science and you've made, you know, some incredible, incredible progress on your project. And you've recognized that there are some uh, some really compelling um, IP that, you know, you could see really having some legs on the commercial market. Um, one of the things that we offer uh, as an Air Force, as a DOD, are programs, commercializations programs specifically, that allow you to take that to the next level, right? And today what we'll be focusing on is one of those programs, which is the STTR, the Small Business Technology Transfer, um, where small businesses uh, are able to secure government contracts to continue their research um, for a particular Air Force application and continue to develop and scale that business and product line um, so that they can achieve not only uh, commercial success on the commercial market, but also success in the defense marketplace as well. So uh, with that, we'll move on to the next, uh, the next slide here. Thanks. So the, uh, ultimately, you know, I'm gonna try to be cognizant of everyone's time. I realize that we're, like, we're running a little bit late, so I'll hit the highlights uh, going through here. Uh, but this slide is, is very important. So ultimately, STTR is, uh, is aimed to commercialize dual-use research. So there's a couple important pieces there. Obviously, commercialize is, is our focus of this program. Um, also, dual-use speaks to the, the commercial market application as well as the defense market applications. So uh, in terms of investment, by diversifying your customer base and diversifying your investment strategy, you're able to really mitigate risk moving forward not only uh, in the, again, in the commercial market, but also the defense marketplace as well. Ultimately, uh, what we're trying to do here is um, leverage the DOD's non-dilutive funding to buy down technical risk uh, for your project and for your research, right? For those of not, not familiar with the investing side and, and the small business side, non-dilutive is simply um, alludes to the fact that when, when we give you these government contracts, when we award these contracts to the small business, the U.S. government, the Air Force, or, uh, does not take any ownership stake in the company. Uh, that is in, in pretty sharp contrast to the, the commercial market where private investment and so on um, you know, require that, 
that equity in, in most cases, or many cases at least, uh, to move forward with them. Um, some of the, the basic requirements, uh, U.S. small business uh, that's registered in, in Dunn's and Sam's, um, we've lowered the, the technical volume requirements to uh, allow um, anyone, to, anyone to apply, and we'll touch on that here in just a moment. Um, it does not require an, all, an already commercialized product. So one of the big value propositions here, again, is, is that these are early, early projects, right? It can be as early as a concept, or you can have a, a min viable product, um, or it be at some early stage of development. And, um, and as long as you have a plan for commercialization, you're going to be a, a good fit for the program. And then also, uh, one of the other main requirements here is that you need to, you being the small business, would need to partner with um, a research institution. Um, and we'll talk about the definition of that, um, which is it certainly includes universities and certainly includes federally funded research and development centers, but it also includes uh, hospitals and military academies and, and a variety of folks who, who also meet uh, the definition that we'll talk about here in just a moment. Um, one important note is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I know, um, well, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, we are awarding government contracts as opposed to grants. Um, historically, you know, both FBIR and STTR have been around for, for decades now, 30 and 40 years respectively. And uh, many times it's, it's, they're thought of as grants. And in, in, in reality, those are contracts that we're giving to the small business. Um, so that's important to note as we move forward. So um, as we move on to the next slide, I'll touch on this just very, very briefly. Thank you very much. Um, this is the definition of research institution. Uh, I'm certainly not going to read it, read it all to you, uh, but the point is I want to want to draw attention to the source there at the bottom. Uh, you can look up the policy directive and, and look up this definition directly. Um, but basically, as I mentioned, this is the partnership opportunities here are not just for universities, although they are certainly included. Um, it also includes a variety, large variety of other opportunities as well uh, to even include entrepreneurship centers, um, nonprofits. Uh, and other types of organizations like that. So uh, we'll move on to the next slide. What we've done with Air Force Ventures, AFWIN, um, uh, AFWorks, and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research is really developed this open topic. For those of you who have been familiar with the programs um, in the last few decades, this is completely different, right? There's a couple things we wanna touch on that are just kind of really substantive changes. Uh, one is the open part of the, the open topic, as it were. Um, the open refers to the fact that any eligible small business with any kind of technology can come through our front door and receive a phase one contract, right? There's the proposal, you go through the process of proposing and, and being evaluated, but there's no restriction in terms of technology area or, um, you know, or uh, interest from the government up front, right? You can come off the street and propose to this program and receive a government contract to, to find those stakeholders in that technology area. Um, additionally, uh, while it's still a three-phase program, uh, we added a, a, a couple of different options that really allow uh, our, our small business partners to move through the process from phase one, as you can see, being kind of customer discovery, uh, phase two, developing a prototype for those customers, um, and then the Strat Phi program, the strategic funding increase. Uh, you may have seen this in media with, with Dr. Roper, um, and the Secretary of Air Force for, for uh, Acquisition and Technology. Uh, you may have seen him talk about some of these. And the point here is that um, there's an opportunity for you to come in the front door with no government experience, no government customer in hand, uh, no particular application necessarily, right, already defined, but find those stakeholders in, in phase one, um, produce your technology for their application in phase two, and grow it in through the strategic funding increase uh, which awards contracts of up to $30 million in, a, in conjunction with uh, up to $30 million of private investment as well. So we're talking, we're going from a 50K three-month project in phase one and just a couple of short years, the opportunity to move to uh, essentially a $60 million contract value um, for growing your business. Um, there's a lot of opportunities otherwise uh, with with these programs, not to mention the, uh, the sole source justification that comes along with them. Um, and that sole source justification is not only for the Air Force, but for the entirety of the federal government. So that, that's a huge deal. So um, in short, when you come in through the, uh, the phase one and say, hey, I have this concept, this idea, right? Um, immediately when starting phase one, your company has a sole source justification for government users, whether it be AFOSR, 
or Special Operations Command or any other um, DOD or fe U.S. federal government entity to come and procure that directly from you. Um, that is in sharp contrast to the way uh, acquisitions work in many other, many other applications where there's a six to 12 month, 18 month delay in the competitive contracting process. Um, and by going through these programs, you get um, uh, that sole source, sole source justification um, immediately upon uh, being awarded that phase one contract. But as we move on, I realize we've got a couple of other slides here. Um, and one of the things we want to mention here on this next slide, uh, when we talk about our evaluation criteria, the high point here is that the, the conversations that we've been having so far, the briefings uh, underlining the, inc the incredible programs that uh, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research um, at the OSD level as well, all these things feed directly into uh, these commercialization programs as well. So the AFOSR's participation and grant money feeds directly into uh, um, these criteria. And what that means is they, they speak directly to it, right? They speak to your defense need, right? AFOSR helps, helps answer that question up front, um, as well as help vetting for the technical and the team aspect uh, that you see there uh, in number three. So I just wanted to make sure that, they, you know, this is a, an important tie-in with the rest of the conversation here. Uh, when, when you're moving through and, and commercializing this, right, uh, AFOSR is the front end of our investment strategy. But when you have uh, receive a grant from AFOSR in your technical area, um, it comes with much more than just that grant check. It comes with an opportunity to on-ramp into the, the commercial and the defense marketplaces um, with substantive uh, you know, opportunities and, uh, and capital growth. Uh, finally, we'll move on to uh, the second to last slide. And I want to hit a couple of high points here um, that really talks through our process and some of the things that, um, uh, that we've seen over the last year or so of the open topic. Um, ultimately, you know, this first bullet says a whole bunch, right? Simply that, you know, for every $1 of SBIR and STTR spending that we've done over the last, uh, uh, last couple of years, these small businesses have seen $5.15 of external investment, right? That, that speaks an incredible amount to uh, the program and to the process that we follow to include Air Force Office of Scientific Research's role uh, in these programs. Um, so as you go through this process, um, you'll see that the confidence that we instill, uh, whether it be in the investors, uh, whether it be the technical vetting um, uh, that happens up front, it speaks to the, the success of the the products and the the, uh, the the technologies as they move through. Additionally, uh, with the second bullet there in the in the table, as you can see, right, the fact that we're we're opening up the STTR program and the SBIR program to any small business um, that has a potential solution for the government, right, we're also completely rewickering the processes on the government side as well. So, if you are familiar with the with the the legacy program, if you will you know that it can take a very long time to get, to get things on contract and get moved through, right? Um, one of the things that we want to make sure that we, we attacked uh, when it comes to our commercial engagement as an Air Force and as a government was to understand um, uh, where we could really tighten up um, on our government processes as well. And so as you can see in that table, we're, we're um, awarding uh, hundreds of government contracts in, in just days. Uh, which is a you know an incredible accomplishment uh, of the team, and um, you know it really speaks to our our dedication to make sure that that this program works really well for not only just small businesses but our our Air Force partners as well. Finally, on our our last slide, what's next? So we are currently working on a uh, an STTR solicitation to uh, to support the Agility Prime, uh, which is our uh, flying car uh, initiative. Uh, you, will see, you, you shall see more information come out about that. Um, if you haven't already uh, been familiar with the Agility Prime effort, uh, make sure to type, type that into Google and you'll find some, uh, some really great resources. They have a wonderful, wonderful website that kind of walks you through the process. Additionally, um, the third iteration for this year is coming up in August. That is the 20.3 for SBIR and 20.C for STTR. Uh, that solicitation opens on 25 August. The proposal window will be, as you can see there, about 20, 
about the 25th of September through the end of October there. And so if you have a, um, a technology that you'd like to see if the Air Force or the government would like to participate in or would like to uh, uh, work with you in developing, uh, that is the, your next stop for finding, finding an opportunity. And then as always, we have, there's a number of Air Force challenges ongoing whether it be for our advanced battle space management system, whether it be for um, you know, F-35 helmets uh, or help the helmet of the future or the base of the future. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities that you can find uh, on that website down below, appworks.af.mil. And uh, looking forward to, to answering any questions here uh, in, in what time we have left for the Q&A. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to do now is ask the morning speakers to come back online. We're going to cut our break a little bit short so that you have time for a Q&A with them. And then after the break, we've got some great sessions coming up with Apex, Doolittle, and Adranos who can provide you adva advice on getting these ideas out into the world that you're providing. So I'm just going to bring up our question sheet right here. And I want to start with some questions for Dr. Nair, who I believe has to go shortly thereafter. And the first question we have is, how much are the how are how much are these funding avenues interested in international research? What are the fields of expertise you prioritize? And in general, what does it take to qualify for some of these items when you're international? So um, I guess. I, I, I think the question, if the question is, um, if you're not a U.S. institution, um, I think that uh, Colonel Avey showed you about some of the opportunities if you are an international organization, how you can participate with the DOD. We have program officers that are scattered around um, the world that their job is to identify great science where a great comes and bring it into the Air Force family. Um, and again, the Army and Navy have similar things. If you're asking the question about what, a, if you are not an, um, an, a, a US citizen, are you eligible? That does depend on the program and each program has very different rules. So um, some of our workforce development kind of activities are tend to, to be focused um, very closely on, um, on, 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 on US citizens. So like the NDSCG fellowships, some of our smart scholarship, some of our young investigator programs and some of the services, those tend to have uh, citizenship requirements. But generally speaking, um, the answer to that is no. So we are very happy to participate with um, anybody wherever they come from, um, if they are here and working in US institutions. Most of our funding does go to US institutions. You can, you can imagine that. But um, we do have an, a strong international program. And the idea, again, is to identify ideas wherever they come from. So we are incredibly interested in working internationally. We're incredibly interested in working with you, regardless of your ethnicity or your, your, your natural, national um, or, your, or your sort of heritage, right? So that is, a, um, that, that, is, that is something that we pride ourselves on. Again, good ideas come from everywhere. And um, our job in basic research um, across the enterprise is to capture those good ideas and see whether we can bring them home to the um, DOD research family. And remind me of the other questions that were not associated with that. The other question is, how do you announce your proposal solicitations? So um, there are multiple ways that, uh, that, that, again, this is a very complicated ecosystem. And I think the first and most important thing I will tell you is get to know a program officer. So if you, since we're talking about um, the Air Force, go to the Air Force R webpage, um, look at their broad area announcement, and you will see the list of program officers, and they have written up for the year what the things are that they care about and what they're looking for proposals and ideas in. From that, they can, um, they can, they can guide you to their single investigator programs. They can share with you um, MURIs and VBFFs and other announcements as they come out if they think that you're um, on their mailing list, et cetera. So the specific programs all have different, very different um, uh, timelines. They all show up on grants.gov. But um, again, I think the, the key to, um, to engaging successfully with the DOD 
regardless of which service you're att uh, attracted, whichever service the program officer you sit in, you're interested in sits in, is to get to know that program officer because they are your guide through this system. And spending the time upfront to get to know them is the best way to figure out what the right places for you to apply are. Muries are open, Europe's are open. There is a uh, call that comes out and that is posted on grants.gov. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Nair. Okay. And now we've got a lot of questions regarding AFSR contracting, but there is one in the chat in particular I wanna highlight because it's relevant to a lot of our other questions. And that is how can we get a program officer to interact with us? Where are they all specifically listed on the web and where are their interests summarized on the web? Okay, um, so if you, if I would direct them to the, the broad, um, the open BAA and each uh, topic area or area of interest is, uh, is, is detailed and at the bottom of that specific um, area, area of interest, there is a box that's designated just for that particular portfolio. Um, you wanna reach out to the program officer via that way if for some strange reason, uh, you know, the program officer is not responsive to you, that's where um, you'll reach out to me. Um, and I have a, there's a, if you look on my um, presentation, the first slide, it has the um, afosr.baa at us.af.mil. Uh, that is the BAA uh, email. I check that daily, uh, a couple of times a day. So anytime you are having a, any uh, disconnect as far as reaching out to a program officer, let me know and I'll make direct contact to that program officer and request that they you know, reach out to you specifically. And I, uh, generally, or normally um, when that happens, they will notify me that this has, um, this has taken place so that I'll know like kind of to take it off of my radar but I do track all of our correspondence and I try to make sure that, you know, you guys are getting a timely response um, whenever it gets to my level. Um, however, I would encourage you um, to, you know, send the email and understand that, you know, there are hundreds of people trying to get in contact with the program officer. So, you know, he just may not have gotten to you or, you know, at, you know, at times the program officers, you know, they may decide to take a, a few days off uh, to kind of, reset their minds or whatnot, or they may be at conferences. So that is, uh, that's the, the best way if you are having issues with getting in contact with the program officer. So reach out to me via the um, afosr.baa email address and I'll respond to you within a day or so, depending on um, if it's a Friday or a holiday. Thank you very much. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time for the Q&A. So one I did want to asked specifically is, is there any program or support for new slash junior researchers or faculty? So, I, hmm. I'm gonna say yes. Um, however, there's not a specific, there may, there may not be a specific program, but if you have any questions or um, I, I, it, it, that kind of that question is so broad, it just depends. So uh, if you want to reach out uh, again, shoot me an email and I'll either I'll give you a call to, I guess, start that conversation and see exactly you know what your concerns are and uh, who might I be able to connect you with. Uh the Young Investigator Program is a is a program that does have some of those characteristics, um, and I know Air Force runs that, even some of the other services. And we have time for one last question before the break. So let me just quickly see. Um, here's a question that came up a few times. How is confidentiality managed in the phase one idea sharing for small businesses? Sure. I, I, it sounds like they're they're alluding to the open topic with SBIR and STTR, mm -hmm. and ultimately, um, the one the proposals when they're put in um, can be confidential and proprietary. 
Uh, the government uses systems that are um, certified to, to handle that level of, of security um, for those proposals specifically. But as you move into phase one, what we, um, uh, when you're going through and, and working with prospective uh, stakeholders throughout the Defense Department um, and the Air Force, there are opportunities for, for you to speak directly with them. Um, you know, we're not sharing the proprietary information with them. Um, you know, when we go through the process, the, the staff have NDAs on file um, just to kind of cover all of those type of issues. Uh, but we facilitate those, those conversations with, with yourself and the defense stakeholders. So uh, we're not passing any proprietary information um, through the small business programs. Uh, those, they're, they're completely unclassified programs, so we don't have to worry about the, the higher level of information in that regard either. Um, so there's, there's, there's minimal chance of, of pushing proprietary information out during phase one, especially. But when we do have that in proposals, uh, we have the, 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 the personnel and the systems that are, are intended to accommodate that. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions at this time. We need to uh, allow some of the participants and hosts to have a short break. But after the break, we'll be having an uh, opportunity to talk with Academic Partnership Engagement Experiment, APEX, and doing a Q&A with them. Next, we'll be hearing from the Doolittle Institute and doing a Q&A. And last, but certainly not least, we'll be hearing a transition success story with Adranos Incorporated, who will also be providing a Q&A. I look forward to seeing everyone after the break. We'll be starting promptly at 10.30. Thank you very much so, for your time and have a great day. So one more, um, one more thing before we go on the break. We're actually gonna take a couple more questions um, before we go on the break. Um, so I have a question for Colonel Avey. And somebody asked if you could talk about the Air Force Centers of Excellence program in more depth. What current uh, COEs are there and what is, the, what is the formation and what future COEs may be coming and what research areas or gaps exist? Okay, that's, that's a detailed question. Um, I, I'll be able to hit some of it, but not all of it right now. First of all, the, the current existing Centers of Excellence are on that slide that I showed. So I think that's probably the best reference but I can talk a little bit about how they are formed. And what actually happens is the technical directors from the Air Force Research Lab put forward topics. So they propose topics for the centers of excellence, big problems that they think could be best addressed by linking together universities doing basic research and the technical directorate or directorates doing applied research. Yeah, we're almost there. Oh, forward one more, there we go. So there are the current ones. So um, we've already initiated the new Center of Excellence for FY20. And I actually, if you give me a second here, I wrote it down, well, the, the full title, because it's just shown um, abbreviated there. Let me make sure I have it. But it's being overseen by our program officer, Jamie Tiley, you see there, and the RX, so the Materials Manufacturing Directorate. The title is Data-Driven Discovery of Optimized Multifunctional Material Systems, and it, the university lead is Carnegie Mellon. So that's the current status. Uh, to go a little bit more in detail, I kind of shared this. We fund the university at about 500K a year for three years, and then depending upon the success of the Center of Excellence, it may be extended for two more years. Um, I don't have any current topics to share that may be upcoming centers of excellence for next year, because again, they are submitted by the technical directors of the Air Force Research Lab for consideration by AFOSR and the POs and are kind of collaboratively decided which way we're going to go forward. And it also is dependent upon what our funding levels are for each year, each fiscal year. So I think that's about all I can update you on at this point in time. Hopefully, oh, one last thing. So there are broad agency announcements or broad area announcements that advertise the centers of excellence once one has been established and we're looking for the university partner or university partners to apply to be part of that center of excellence. Hopefully that helps, all right. Okay, we're going to ask a couple more questions. Um, 
do you provide proposal review comments to the PIs for declined proposals? Was asked in the chat. Uh, yes, normally the uh, the program officers will have that responsibility. They will review the proposals, and if it's something that that is not high on the, I guess, their level of um, or of how they rank their proposals, then they should be given some form of feedback. Uh, it, it may be they may do it over the phone or they may do it via email. And if you don't feel like you've gotten adequate feedback, again, you know, shoot an email to me and I'll, you know, reach out to the program officer so that you can get that. Another question we have, is there a database and means to network with prior SBIR and STTR awardees? And do you have any means to assist a startup beginning with phase one? Hey, those are, those are really great questions. Um, ultimately, um, the SBIR and STTR databases are public. So you can go on to the SBIR STTR website and, uh, and look up and, and see who has received uh, awards previously. So that's the, the first question there. Number two is that when the pre-solicitation opens, we do hold a number of AMA sessions. Those are ask me anything type of webinars where we walk through the instructions. Uh, we walk through what is required, how everyone's evaluated, uh, make sure questions are answered in a, in a public forum so that everybody's working off the, the same sheet of music as it were. Um, ultimately, one of the, one of the really, uh, really great things that we've seen in the, in the program is that um, over 40%, uh, excuse me, over 70% of the companies who are working with us are non-traditional. That is to say they haven't done business with the Air Force before or with the government. And so uh, we're very much in tune with uh, making sure that everyone understands how the program works, what we need from them, what what uh, materials will be treated along the way, um, and you know how they'll be evaluated and all of that. So um, to answer your question, yes, you can certainly find out who the prior, uh, prior awardees were. And in addition to that, uh, we hold a number of, of uh, engagements to kind of help level the playing field and um, answer questions that the community has regarding the, the solicitation. Thank you. And then from the YouTube stream, we have a question. How do you recommend connecting to and getting to know program officers at the time of COVID? Uh, could you ask that question again? How do you recommend contacting and getting to know program officers in the time of COVID-19? Uh, yeah, again, so, you know, each program officer has uh, an email specifically ded dedicated to their portfolio. So I recommend reaching out to uh, those program officers. But again, if you are having an issue um, getting in contact with the program officer, shoot me an email and I'll, you know, I'll forward it to the program officer and or their supervisor to ensure that you know, you guys are, you know, getting a timely response. All right, thank you. And from Jennifer Woods, we have, how do we find out when grant writing courses are being offered? So that's gonna kind of fall on the university. Uh, right now, we, you know, we don't have any uh, specific connections and that's something that, you know, if we can look at um, and, maybe add to our our website, you know, potential courses that, you know, uh, offering of the courses, but currently, uh, you know, you would have to research, you'd have to go out and find which particular uh, grant courses are out there. All right. Are non-tenure track faculty eligible for some of these programs? Yes. And it depends. It depends on the program, but yes. And then, and I believe this one's more for the comms team, so they may answer this in the chat or they can but they can pop in. Is there a mailing list we can join to receive upcoming basic research meetings and events from AFRL? Hi, there is, and we're gonna go ahead and add it to the APM resource page right now. So um, if you wanna go ahead and sign up, for a mailing list, it will be there momentarily. All right, thank you very much, comms team.
I had one one quick input on the uh, the question before last in regards to uh, tenure folks and non tenure folks. So one of the cool um, the caveats of the STTR program is that the the government will allow the PIs for the small businesses to be employed either by the small business, as one would expect with the with the business program, but they can also be primarily employed at the research institution. So you can have tenured uh, professors, you can have non tenured folks, you know, re regardless who could uh, start a small business, receive these government contracts uh, while still maintaining their primary employment at, uh, at a research institution or a university. Over. All right. We're going to do one last question. How is the, and I believe we touched upon this before, but we're just having someone ask for clarity. How is confidentiality managed in the phase one idea sharing? Uh, a great question. I think we touched on it a little bit earlier, but ultimately um, anything that um, is provided to our government uh, stakeholders or other companies even, is uh, are things or materials that you have explicitly said is okay to be passed. Um, the proposals uh, can certainly be proprietary and they're handled on systems that are certified to handle that that level of information on the government side. Um, but past that, anything that is provided to other folks, uh, we receive your direct permission to do so. So that's a, an important aspect as well. All right, and thank you very much. We're running a little bit late, but we're gonna take a five minute break and then we'll be hearing from our next set of speakers. If we were unable to address your question, we have been recording all these questions in the backgrounds and we'll work with the Air Force to compile an FAQ so that you can get answers to some of your additional questions. I would also like to point out that the aforementioned BAA has access to all the emails if you need to directly reach to an appropriate program officer. And we'll see everyone shortly after the break. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to be getting started with Apex in about two minutes, everyone. Two minutes. Okay, we're going to get started with Apex shortly. Once again, if we do not get to your question from the previous speakers, we are logging all those questions in the background and we'll be handing them off and trying to get your answers up on the AEPAM website as soon as possible. Welcome back everyone. Our PIA Partner Academic Partnership Engagement Experiment, or APEX, will be our next set of speakers. Leading, kicking us off is Mary Margaret Evans, Executive Director of APEX. She has more than 20 years experience as an executive leader in the Department of Defense, and she has led projects on research development, acquisitions, arms control negotiations, manufacturing and industrial based policies, and many, many more. Ms. Evans, I now hand off the presentation to you. Thank you, Matt, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Matt um, uh, mentioned, I do have um, a considerable experience in the Department of Defense, also uh, 10 plus years in the private sector. I mention that because APEX, our, the newest Air Force PIA, is all about connections, connecting the private sector uh, with the DOD. And so it's important that you can speak DOD and also private sector um, if you're a part of the team uh, for, in APEX. Again, APEX is the newest of the Air Force PIAs. It is a program under the Wright State Applied Research Corporation um, and is sponsored out of AFRL. Um, we have been around not quite a year, but we have um, a, a very ambitious um, uh, set of goals uh, set forward for us. And so um, we will go over some of those at a very high level uh, with you today. Um, next slide, please. So um, we have a slightly larger team than the four faces you see there, but um, these are folks who are uh, participating in today's webinar. Uh, Dave Nestick will be talking to you shortly about STTR and how we are focusing on trying to bring uh, companies that have participated in the small business program into a phase three award. Uh, Bruce Howard um, is our lead for analytics. Analytics is the foundation for much of the work that we do here at Apex. And Aaron Holden is our liaison to the Air Force, uh, helping us keep connected so we understand their needs and their concerns uh, so that we can meet them. Next slide, please. So here's what we're gonna go through here um, at a very high level. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our overall capabilities and approach and a little bit about education and training. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and to Bruce to talk to you about our regional and national um, outreach and uh, data analytics. Next slide, please. So you'll see on the left-hand side, um, our overall approach to um, all of the APEX efforts. Um, 
I would say uh, right up front that data analytics is a foundational element for all of our activities, um, including um, identifying collaborators and innovators, looking for opportunities, answering specific questions that uh, folks in the Air Force might have about who's doing what type of research. Uh, we've even helped identify participants uh, for webinars such as this one with a heavy emphasis on bringing in non-traditionals. These are universities and small businesses that have not typically done work uh, with the department in the past. Uh, we are working to build a network of innovators and technologists across uh, universities, small business and government. And our, our initial emphasis has been in the Appalachian region. And Dave will talk to you a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, we are working also to develop and deploy targeted education programs that really, um, the goal there is to reach out to small businesses and universities who are interested in doing business with the government and create a series of very modern videos that will step you through in a very quick and easy fashion what you need to do to uh, get a phase one, two, or three award in the small business program. We're also doing a lot of work um, in the innovation arena. I'm not gonna talk as much about the last two, but we are working um, uh, with on the innovation um, uh, front with AFRL and others, looking specifically at the human element of innovation and how to best use uh, the right people for the right goals um, to create things like high-performing teams, and to put on blue sky events and or workshops. Um, we are also uh, at the back end of the technology uh, pipeline, looking to connect some of the applied research, and that is our main focus, applied research, uh, moving it through um, the technical readiness levels and connecting it ultimately um, with our warfighters through the acquisition um, community and the primes and the PMs uh, that support that, those community efforts. Next slide, please. So on the, here's a little bit about our education and training approach. Um, we are um, uh, working to create, again, as I, I stated earlier, some state-of-the-art online videos to help train folks on how to participate effectively in the small business program. Our concept is to create three, uh, faith, three levels of training, if you will, that correspond with the different phases of the program. At the level, uh, first level, getting to phase one, um, those videos will be uh, more introductory in nature and the video length um, for what we've created to date, three to five minutes in length. You can see on the right hand side as you move from phase one to two and then phase three and beyond, the videos become longer as the material becomes more complex. Um, we are just in the early uh, stages of um, creating um, this uh, curriculum, if you will. Um, it is our hope that once we are complete this, we can um, turn this into a certification program for people who are interested in knowing more and, and being recognized as uh, conversant um, in this particular program. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Mr. Dave Nestick, who is our STTR program director. Dave. Thanks, Mary Margaret. Um, we have both a regional and a national approach to building university and small business relationships. On a regional basis, we chose the Appalachian region of the U.S. as a first territory for a number of reasons. Um, it's a congressionally defined area of the U.S. with the largest dedicated federal economic development organization in the country called the Appalachian Regional Commission. Um, the Appalachian Regional Commission, or, or it's also known as the ARC, encompasses a region of 13 states and 420 counties. In this area, we have regional partners that we work with um, that are both uh, technology business development organizations with ties to the ARC. And the knowledge base and contacts of the ARC gives us a quick start in this region. 
Also, this region includes uh, 18 R1 and R2 universities, which provides a fertile ground for us to test uh, methods before nationwide uh, application. So I want to stress, though, that our outreach service in this region is in partnership with our subs, but Apex provides support nationwide during proposal periods for those companies of interest in the SBIR or SDTR program. So the way we conduct outreach and support is both broad and targeted. Our regional partners assist with general network building and assistance with regional companies at the top of the SBIR STTR funnel. Um, they assist with introductions, outreach, workshops, support and coaching in the region. But from the core APEX team, we take a more focused, targeted approach during proposal releases to identify and work most closely with university spinouts that are in areas of interest to the Air Force and are natural, naturally suited to the STTR program due to their connection with the university. So during the uh, DOD release period, we will work with our data analytics team to find researchers of interest aligned with specific topic areas and work with the regional partner to approach and assist those researchers or spin-outs should they want to pursue SBAR or SDTR funding. Once the companies we support enter the funnel or achieve the phase one award, we work with them more intensely to help them navigate the internal processes of working with the Air Force assisting with the process of building connections and mentoring them towards uh, phase three outcomes. So that's in a high level, um, the STTR program. I'm gonna turn it over now to, um, to the next speaker. Hello, thank you, Dave. So Apex's analytics efforts, which I've mentioned here briefly, um, are really focused on mapping, uh, growing, and leveraging global innovation ecosystems and bringing members of those innovation ecosystems into the DoD fold. Uh, in order to do that, we use a combination of graph analytics to exploit both the co-authorship and citation networks across more than 300 million different publications. Um, we use machine learning and time series models to learn uh, what uh, individual researchers are up to and also to predict what particular areas of technology, uh, what sorts of metrics they will be able to accomplish over some period of time in order to inform metrics. Uh, we also use uh, network science to explore the structural properties of our own award networks to figure out how we can better incentivize research teams to accelerate innovation for insertion into Air Force platforms. And of course, in order to do this, uh, we, use, uh, we have to use a lot of natural language processing in order to extract meaning from source documents, not only within the literature, but from within DOD documents as well, uh, through requirements clustering and others. And of course, because innovation is global, we do this actually in over 20 different languages. Um, and finally, we're developing new uh, bibliometrics so that will move beyond impact factor and start to measure things like commercialization potential of publications or the transition potential of a given research team's uh, project. Um, and uh, that, that's it for me. Thank you, Bruce. Um, this is our last slide. Um, here's how you can contact us via email, our website, or LinkedIn. Uh, we are headquartered in Dayton, but uh, the team is geographically dispersed and um, very agile. So um, we hope that's uh, whet your appetite for uh, working with us um, in the applied research arena. And uh, we, we encourage you to reach out if we can and be of any help to you. And that's what we had for you today. Matt, over to you. Thank you very much. So before we get started, uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat that we were sent for Apex. So first question for Apex. What makes Apex different from the other partnership intermediary agreements? And for those who need a reminder, PIAs or partnership intermediary agreements are nonprofit institutions, including universities that serve as an intermediary institution between academia, labs, industry, and our government sponsors, in this case, AFRL. 
So Matt, I'll take that one. Um, I think one of the things that makes APEX unique is that it supports the whole Air Force. Um, a majority of the PS are doing really great work supporting a particular directorate um, in a lab, um, and that is their primary focus. Um, our uh, mission our, um, that we've been given is uh, to help connect not only the different directorates in AFRL, but to support uh, the Air Force and its technical needs um, and innovation needs, um, connect the PIAs with each other. So we've reached out to pretty much all of them at this point and are actively working with any number of them. Um, and so I, I think that uh, that makes us a, a bit unique. Uh, we are looking at the entire um, technology uh, pipeline, if you will, trying to feed the open topics that you heard about um, from AFWorks um, on the front end, um, supporting AFOSR as we can, and then um, also the applied research and moving technology across what many people call the valley of death uh, from the research phase actually into um, the acquisition community um, so that the technology can ultimately end end up in the hands of a user, in this case, primarily the warfighter. Uh, so that's a little bit more about APEX. And I think the broad um, a nature of our charter makes us a little unique in, in that perspective. I hope that uh, answered your question. Mm -hmm. From the chat, we have a question, um, just asking for some clarification on the data, Alex. Are, is APEX using Dala Alex techniques for AFRL or are they using it to find researchers and projects for AFRL? So if we want, I'm actually gonna bring the Dala Alex slide back up. Yeah, I'm gonna encourage Bruce um, to go into that. Uh, we actually do both, uh, but I'll let him talk a bit to that. Bruce? Yeah, You'll need to yeah, talk so, to you. Uh, yeah. We're, so we do indeed do both, and and we utilize different techniques for different customers and different questions, of course. Um, in order to uh, serve the Air Force and the broader research community generally, uh, as an example, one of the things that we're doing is uh, we've been building out the authorship and citation networks of internal um, uh, AFRL and other DOD labs, uh, s &T reports, and uh, then classifying them using a topic modeler uh, with respect to what the research uh, in the s &T report is about. Um, and what we do is we find the most commonly cited authors within a particular discipline across all of DOD's internal research. And we look to see if um, those researchers in the broader research community are actually interfacing with the people who have been citing them most prominently. Um, and if not, we then encourage them to connect. Uh, additionally, we'll do things like look at the uh, semantic structure of those reports and look for similar items in the literature to make recommendations. Um, and then for the purposes of building like a transdisciplinary project on, on some large defense um, goal, uh, we will make recommendations to the Air Force with respect to uh, institutions or individual investigators uh, broken down by topic area. So within our model of, of, of research, we have over 700,000 different topics in which we classify more than 300 million publications. So we can get all the way down to the protein or waveform uh, in which there is interest, but we can also roll those things up in a hierarchy to broader levels of Instead, the question is more broad with respect to like material science versus some plasmonic resonance issue or something like that. If that's helpful, clarify. All right, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, for our last Apex question, it was asked, what services are you currently providing to universities and university researchers? Dave, do you want to take that? Yes. Let's see. So, um, you know, what we'll do is, is, you know, around each university, there's typically an entrepreneurial ecosystem that supports 
tech transfer out of the university. So what we do is we'll, we'll connect with uh, the university to, to, to build a relationship into that network. Um, with the university partner, then we'll conduct you know, in-depth workshops, you know, and we'll take like a 50,000 foot view, a 30,000 foot view, and then a 10,000 foot view where we, you know, first we'll have a workshop where we'll engage with the university researchers and the, the small businesses around the, the university and the spin outs, um, just to give them, you know, the background on, on the SBIR program, and then dive a little bit deeper into the DOD and the Air Force program, and then dive deeper yet into what it really takes to put together a good proposal and what the experience is like, you know, being in the SBIR program. So we'll kind of, you know, open things up and, and really talk about, um, you know, uh, participating in the program. A lot of the people in our support staff have actually gone through it, written proposals, and, and had to, you know, get paid by SBIRs. Um, so then we'll also then when during the release periods, we'll dive deep into the instructions. We'll we'll uh, conduct uh, workshops to really help them navigate, you know, the program. Make sure they're they're addressing the proper instructions. They're finding the information they need on the websites. And, um, and, and help them, you know, if they have questions, you know, as they're going through their proposal process. Those that we work with that actually then achieve awards, we'll, uh, we'll set up mentoring sessions, you know, um, to, to, to work directly with them on answering any questions or advising them or, or uh, just being, um, you know, a helpful guide and helping to make a, a connection or, or, or uh, uh, you know, helping them get over some hurdles or something like that. Um, and then, you know, within our team too, we'll connect them to our tech pole team that's working the other end of the funnel um, to help them build connections and, and pull them through the pipeline. So um, we, we, we tend to take a really engaged approach with the people that we work with. And um, uh, that's, you know, that's the kinds of assistance that we provide. All right, and I want to once again thank all of our speakers from APEX. Next up is the PIA partner Doolittle Institute. The Doolittle Institute, like most of our PIA partners, acts as an intermediary between institutions and academia, labs, industry, and government sponsors, and in this case, AFRL. And their job is to help all of these various organizations work together. And it's my proud privilege to introduce Carolyn Fries, director of the Doolittle Institute. Carolyn. Okay, hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, and is the video working too? I'm not, I can't see myself anywhere, but I guess everyone else can, so. It is. Okay, let's see. So it's still, it's still morning here in Western Florida, which is the Panhandle. We're the odd part of Florida, it's on Central Time not Eastern time. So there is a portion of Florida that is on central time and that's us. Uh, so welcome everybody. It's still morning here. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Pat. Um, so Doolittle Institute was founded with Jimmy Doolittle being our namesake. So we're named after Jimmy Doolittle and the Doolittle Raid from World War II, where they retrofitted B-25 bombers to be able to take off from aircraft carriers. So it's that rapid innovation that took place during that time to be able to make that happen in less than four months after the bombing of, of Pearl Harbor happened. So, you know, he is who we're named after, not the veterinarian and, and that sort of thing. So um, just wanted to kind of give you some background. Um, next slide, please. Oh, back one, we jumped ahead. There we go, okay. So the Doolittle Institute is operated under a partnership intermediary agreement between the Air Force Research Lab Munitions Directorate at Eglin Air Force Base and our corporate parent, which is called Defense Works. Um, Doolittle Institute is unique in that not only does Defense Works operate multiple PIAs around the company, around the country, sorry about that, um, but we're also part of the AFRL Innovation Institute family. So I kind of talk about our two different families that we have. So first one being DefenseWorks, 
Uh, we are co-located with the corporate office in Niceville, Florida, which is in the Panhandle. So that's the star on the map that you see. Um, another PIA is down in the Tampa Bay area, which is Softworks for US SOCOM. Um, next, we have MGM Works in Montgomery, Alabama uh, that works with Air University. Then there's ERDIC Works or ERDC Works with the Engineering Research and Development Corporate or Consortium at um, the Army Corps of Engineers. And then also there is a new PIA in Augusta, Georgia that recently, they were still a TBA on the name, but that will be called the Cyber Fusion Innovation Center. So that's with Army Cyber. Um, and additionally, not on this map is a new PIA as well um, that is in Monterey, California called NPS Work with the Naval Post Graduate School. Um, so that PIA will be coming online soon as well. And then on the Innovation Institute side of the family for AFRL, um, there's the Doolittle Institute in Diceville again. Then there's the Griffiths Institute up in Rome, New York, a Wright Brothers Institute in Dayton, Ohio, um, the BRIC, which you're all familiar with. Thank you for organizing this today along with APEX. And then also AFRL New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So next. Four main objectives in our statement of objectives through the PIA collaborative agreement that we have with AFRL. Uh, first one being technology transfer. So that is whether it's spin in or spin out of technology um, of, of, in, of research that's taking place. So tech transfer, traditional tech transfer is spin out through creatives, patent licensing agreements, that sort of thing, or looking for things to spin into the uh, DOD from outside work of industry. Uh, technology transition tends to focus more on trying to get those technologies out to the warfighter and a lot of times does involve technology transfer to make that transition to the warfighter's hands, um, but it is kind of considerate separate within the Air Force. Um, innovation and collaboration is really all about finding new ways and new people to do business and research with the Air Force Research Lab. And then the last thing is workforce development, which is whether we're working with existing uh, workforce to retain them and enhance their abilities and train them, um, or looking forward to uh, you know, training tomorrow's research scientists and engineers through our STEM programs. So next slide. Um, these are just some photographs of our facility. Our facility in Niceville, Florida has about 19,000 square feet. Um, if you've never been there, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, we've actually had a couple of AFOSR program reviews there. Um, so some of the AFOSR folks have been there and some of the other university folks on the, on the webcam here may have been there as well. Um, fabulous facility, you're all welcome to come down anytime. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide just kind of talks about some of the different types of things we do for AFRL. Um, innovation discovery gets are focused around the tech transfer aspect. So kind of hoping to um, increase the quality and quantity of patents at the lab there for potential licensing and commercialization. Um, so innovation discovery events were developed by Navy Crane in Indiana some years ago. Um, and they essentially allow the researchers to spend, you know, less than 10 minutes on a presentation about their technology or their idea to a panel of experts, both from business and technical experts. And those experts essentially work with them to just give information and help them increase their patent claims. So um, just in a very basic example, if you know somebody was designing something pink, they'd say, oh, well, what if you made it blue? Could you use it for this, that, and something else and expand it to a new industry? So that's the type of thing that they do in those innovation discovery events. It's a very positive environment. Um, the Doolittle Institute has also done a number of sprints. In addition to the technology sprint that's mentioned here, we've also done business process sprints um, and also cyber sprints. Um, that has been a great success for us in that we had two uh, recently awarded cyber companies that came in last year and they spent a week with the program manager and a bunch of mm. subject matter experts kind of doing a kickoff meeting through the sprint process. And at the end of that week, they were really able to walk away with a good idea of what AFRL was looking for and how their particular product would fit into the larger system at hand. Um, so when I'm talking to those companies, they said it saved them months of development time being able to do that and, and have those questions answered immediately and, and, and ideas that they had 
um, you know, go ahead and explore some of those ideas right away and decide whether they're going in the right direction or not. Um, crowdsource challenges, we also use the Innocentive platform to do uh, global cloud crowdsource challenges. Um, we had one last year and we're hopefully going to have some more this year as well. Um, tech exchange events, uh, one recent event that we had was our university day and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so that's just an opportunity to get people together and to exchange information on different research that's taking place. Um, and we also last fall in November held the inaugural hypersonics pitch day, uh, which was a phase two small business innovation research or SBIR award. Um, there was $5.25 million that was awarded at that particular event. And that was a collaboration between obviously the small business innovation research office. Um, at the time it was the life cycle management center or the program executive office for weapons um, and also AFRL and the Doolittle Institute. So next slide. Um, as part of our workforce development efforts, we run the first Lego leagues throughout Northwest Florida from uh, Tallahassee on the east side, which is Florida's capital, um, all the way to Pensacola, which is almost near the Alabama border on the west side. Uh, so we run those leagues all the way from ages four up to mid-teens. Um, in addition, we collaborate with headquarters AFRL on the legacy program. Uh, we run the legacy summer camps and those are actually taking place starting this week virtually uh, for the first time. So unfortunately we couldn't have in-house kids this year, uh, which is funny because the first week you get upset because the kids are making so much noise, but by the end of it, when they leave, it's so quiet, you kind of miss them in a weird way. Um, in addition, we participate with the AFRL scholars program in that we have um, several scholars that actually work with our STEM folks in the summertime. Uh, working on those programs, in addition to the, uh, the scholars that actually work physically out at the lab. We don't run that program, we just participate in that. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, this is a slide on AFRL, the Munitions Directorate. Um, there is also a brochure that's available for download that goes into much more detail about what the Munitions Directorate does. Um, but in general, if you look in the four corners of this slide, um, upper left, you see ordnance sciences. And I, I always kind of joke because that's the part that goes boom. And then the other three corners really are, are about getting the, the weapon to its target. So there's a little bit of a fun competition within the lab of, of which is more important. Because the folks that are into the you know, modeling and simulation and guidance, navigation and control and seeker sciences, they all say, well, if it doesn't hit the target, it doesn't matter. And then the other guys all say, oh, well, if, if it doesn't do anything once it gets there, it doesn't matter. So there's a kind of this fun competition there. But this gives you some idea of some of the different things they do at the munitions directorate there. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about some more specific things, um, conferences that they have coming up that AFRL is involved with. Um, but again, I encourage you to download that brochure if you're interested in more information about AFRL munitions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a little more detail about the AFRL Scholars Program. Um, this is open through um, high school, through PhD students, um, as well as professional educators. Um, one great thing that comes out of this, in addition to the practical experience that you get in the lab, is most folks who go through this program exit the program at the end of the summer with a security clearance. Um, which if you're looking to get a job in the industry, being able to have that security clearance in your, pro in your pocket when you're interviewing is huge for you. Um, so they're 10 week paid internships, um, excellent program, highly competitive. Um, generally the application period opens in the October, November timeframe. And then you'll generally hear by February or March the following year and the program starts in June uh, through August in the summertime. So next slide, please. Um, here are some more research opportunities uh, with AFRL for university folks. I'm going to drop some links in the chat box here if anybody wants to grab those. Let me paste all those in. Did that all go? Yep, okay. Okay, so I just pasted all these links as well as a couple of others there. I'm going to follow my cheat sheet here. Um, so the first one, the AFRL MLOI, is the Mathematical Modeling and Optimization Institute, uh, which is actually run by University of Florida and University of Central Florida. 
um, and they are the hiring agents. It's not limited only to University of Florida and University of Central Florida uh, researchers, so it is open to all university researchers, um, but it does take place at the Florida Research and Engineering and Education Facility, or the REEF, um, which is located just off base here up in Niceville, Florida. Um, so that's an opportunity for postdoc and graduate students to come in and do collaborative research with the lab. Um, SMART, I believe folks talked about earlier, that's, that's through AFOSR as well. Um, the big thing about that one is that is a scholarship for, uh, for service. So if you accept the scholarship to pay for your graduate school, you are then required to put in a certain amount of years of service with the lab after that. Um, applications open that open for that on August 1st. So that's coming up soon as well. And again, open to bachelor's, bachelor's master's, and PhD folks. Um, through that, you get full tuition, monthly stipends, health insurance. Um, it's a great program if, if you can get into it and you're willing to you know, do that service on the, on the back end of it. Um, the STFP is a fellowship program for postdocs that has um, quarterly applications due. Um, that's actually through the National Research Council Associateship Program. So again, another option to come in and do work with the research lab um, applications, um, February, May, August, and November 1st on that. Um, summer Faculty Fellowship Program. Um, this is something that every year AFRL and Munitions Directorate participates in. I generally see them coming in and out and doing uh, various talks at the reef during the summertime. Um, so that's another thing. So eight to 12 weeks, um, you need to be a PhD um, and also have an existing appointment at an accredited university. Um, interesting thing, you can bring a graduate student with you. Um, so it's not just for the researcher, it's also for one of their grad students. And the applications for next year will open on September 1st uh, through November 30th is the application period. Um, next thing, I believe they talked about this earlier, the engineering graduate student fellowships. Um, again, very similar to some of the others. Um, looking at that link there, it doesn't seem like it's been active in recent years, so this may not be the best of the options there. Um, next thing is the visiting scientist program. Um, that's kind of the reverse. That's where somebody from AFRL can actually come to work with you and your university. Um, so that's another good option, um, up to 179 days. And I do know as part of the Air Force Science and Technology 2030 strategy, um, they have been promoting all of these programs to increase their interactions with universities um, to not only improve research, but also you know, kind of future workforce development to get more folks working into the lab once they graduate from college. Um, and then the last one is the DOD or AFRL Center of Excellence and Autonomy. That was also mentioned earlier. Um, so that's a joint thing between uh, University of Florida, Duke, uh, UT at Austin, and University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, again, I put that link in the, in the website or in the posting in the notes there in the chat box. Um, that is also available to potentially get involved and learn more about what's going on. Um, and then one other thing that's not actually listed on here is on Defense Innovation Marketplace. Um, there are communities of interest. So if you look under communities of interest on Defense Innovation Marketplace, um, that particular thing is really geared more for industry, but they're also encouraging academia to get involved. I think it's very similar. It seems like industry and academia tend to maintain separate worlds. Um, if you go to a lot of uh, professional societies like IEEE or ASME or that type of thing, it tends to be a lot of university folks presenting and there's always a frustration to get more industry people. And I think when you deal with you know, programs such as the Communities of Interest and National Defense uh, Industrial Association or NDIA, you know, they're looking to get more university people to collaborate with those industry folks. So um, just another opportunity to be able to get there. And again, the links for these are in the chat box. Uh, next. So I mentioned earlier that one of our objectives is technology transfer. So here's some common tech transfer mechanisms where universities can get involved um, in particular. So if you look at the center column there for educational institutions, um, you can do commercial test agreements where you actually um, hire or pay for utilization of 
of uh, equipment and testing facilities at the federal labs and AFRL, which is a federal lab. Um, there's also cooperative research and development agreements, um, which have kind of taken the place of what the educational partnership agreement used to be. Um, so CRADAs historically have been between the industry and the national labs or the federal labs, um, but now they're doing those with research as well. And, and I would urge folks, even if you have an existing grant with um, AFRL, to consider doing a CRADA as well that will kind of cover you from an intellectual property standpoint um, beyond what the contract agreement or the grant agreement may state. It just allows you to do a little bit of expanded work outside the scope of the particular agreement that you have in place. Um, and in addition, if you do not currently have a grant from AFRL, you might want to consider doing a CRADA to just be able to explore some ideas in an unfunded type environment um, that could then potentially lead to funding. It's kind of a foot in the door opportunity for you. Um, educational partnership agreements these days are geared more toward um, education and STEM in particular. Um, so I won't spend much time on that. Um, information transfer agreements, that's typically software. So if a university has software that a lab needs or vice versa, if a university wants to use some software that was developed at AFRL, um, they could do that through an information transfer agreement. Um, MOU, MOA, everybody knows what those are. And then the other thing is a material transfer agreement, which is another great opportunity. If you're doing collaborative research with AFRL and AFRL owns a particular piece of equipment that you need to use at your lab, you can do a material transfer agreement that would allow you then to take that piece of equipment and then relocate it to your university um, for the period of your collaborative research. So uh, next slide, please. Um, some other things that we do, a lot of the events that we have at the Doolittle Institute are closed to the public because they're dealing specifically with AFRL things. And so it's only the collaborators that get involved, but we do have a number of you know, educational lectures and various things at, at, the, at uh, the Doolittle Institute. So this just kind of highlights some of the various things that we've had there in the past. Uh, next slide. Um, to talk a little bit more about the innovation discovery events, this is a great way for university researchers to potentially get involved as panelists, um, which is again a way to get to know the researchers at the lab. Um, we're always looking for new people to participate in our innovation discovery events as panelists. And again, we have people from industry, academia, government, um, all sorts of folks to participate in these panels. So if you know, anybody is doing research in the area of interest to the munitions director that would like to get involved in an innovation discovery event as a panelist, you know, please reach out to us by all means. Uh, next slide. Um, just a little bit more about the hypersonic pitch day. Um, again, this was part of the SBIR, STTR program. Um, but as they talked earlier about SBIR and STTR, the STTR in particular is a great way for university research um, to be commercialized out into industry. So if you have a faculty member or a graduate student that has a, um, a spin out company from some of the research, you know, getting involved in the STTR program is, is a fabulous thing. And the pitch days are going on around the country on all different topics. Um, AppWorks has been running the majority of those pitch days, um, but there's a couple of other folks that have been doing them as well, but definitely keep an eye out for those in the future. Um, Cause it's a very, it's a rapid way to be able to get funding and AppWorks has done a fabulous job with, with getting at least that initial um, dollop of funding to the companies very quickly so that you can get started on the work with having, without having to wait for months to get that money in there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this was a, a slide about our inaugural University Day, which again is targeted toward that Air Force Science and Technology Strategy Objective number three, which is related to workforce and new partnerships. Um, this was really great because we were able to have, uh, you know, 52 abstracts from, you know, 18 different states around the country um, we were kind of excited because one of the ones that was selected was from Hawaii. So that was kind of, and surprisingly, the, we didn't have any problems with the virtual event with somebody, you know, webcasting from Hawaii. We had no problem with that. Um, this particular university day 
Uh, we did result in a number of the researchers after the event was over uh, being contacted by AFRL to receive some seed funding for their research um, because they were selected as being, you know, some of the ones that were of interest. So while this event was not originally intended to be, you know, sort of a, a challenge or a pitch day type event where people were awarded a check at the end of the day, um, I believe it was four of the universities did end up getting funding um, afterwards. And AFRL has expressed interest and we're exploring some options in how we might be able to make um, that funding part of the event in the future. Uh, we're still working with contracting on how we have to do all that to you know, follow all the legal regulations and everything. But um, we're looking forward to having more university days next year. Uh, so definitely keep in touch and, and look out for the topics that we have. Again, this one, if you look in the lower right was you know, imagery photonics. Um, extreme environments, vibration, plasmonics, and nano as well. So those are the topics we did for this one, but there'll be new ones in the future. So next slide. Um, I haven't had a chance to get kind of a wrap up of this one. So this was our promotional slide for the Cyber Day that we had uh, back on the 4th of June. Uh, so we had over 300 people register for this one and about 178, 180 people on at any one time. Um, so these were some of the talks that we had there and the speakers. Um, we've been doing these once a year. This is the fourth year that we've done it. And so we'll be doing another one of these next year. Um, so again, a, a great opportunity to, to look out and learn some about, about the SBIRS TTR program from another source. Uh, next slide. Um, here's a conference that's coming up that's actually being um, organized by two of the AFRL munitions directorate researchers. Um, we affectionately call them the Allens. Um, so Monica and Jeff are working on this IEEE Rapid, and I believe this is the third or fourth year that they've done it. Um, unfortunately, this year they're going to have to go virtual on it, but um, you can see IEEE-Rapid.org for more information on that. So if you are working in the photonics area, I definitely encourage you to take a look and sign up. Um, it's too late at this point, I believe, to do a talk, um, but to be able to tune in and then potentially get involved at a more level next year. Uh, next slide, please. I think that's my piece. So we cannot do this without the great team that we have at DI. So this is our current staff as of now. Um, just a fabulous group of people. They make my life easy. They make my work easy. And I, I couldn't be happier to have each and every one of them on board. Um, next slide, I believe, is the last, which is just kind of some general information. So we are social. So we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So keep up with us there, and uh, we'll find out what's going on. Thank you so much. And now we've got a bunch of questions in the chat for Doolittle. So um, the most common and prevalent, and anyone from AFOSR or AFRL might want to chime in on this one also, is do AFRL scholars have to be US citizens? And this includes areas like SFFP, and is there eligibility for non-tenure track? Um, yes, citizenship is required in, in all of these instances, um, at least for AFRL scholars. And main reason being is you're, you're looking to get that, that security clearance at the end. So for AFRL scholars, yes, definitely security clearance. Um, and a lot of smart, you have to have, um, you have to be a US citizen as well. Um, I don't know if somebody from AFOSR wants to hop on as well, but um, a lot of them, you do have to be US citizens, yes. And then and I believe someone just addressed this in the chat from the comms team, but what's the best way to get notified when pitch days or university days are announced in the future? Um, is really through our social media. Um, that, and you can also go to the Doolittle Institute and sign up for our um, email newsletters, which we go out of our way to not make them too frequent. So, you know, they come out once a month, I believe. So it's not like you're going to be inundated with more email. There's also an APAN link that's been dropped in the chat. Um, speaking of the chat, Director Fries, I want to let you know that those links you tried placing in the chat earlier did not go through. We'll work, we'll work to make sure those get on the APAN site. Okay, thanks. 
Um, next question, where are some of the ways that Doolittle collaborates with universities on innovation and workforce development? Um, you know, most of our future workforce development has been has been through our STEM programs, um, really geared toward kind of that pre-university, getting them to go into the universities. Um, other than our university day, that was kind of our first big foray into getting the universities involved. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, AFOSR has a program review. I believe it's it's one of the, oh, I'm not, I can't even remember what it is. Um, the group that comes in to do the program review at our place, but definitely willing to look at uh, more opportunities for that. Okay, um, this is a more general question. And if anyone from AFRL or AFOSR wants to chime in, but relate it to using the AFRL Scholars Program to get security clearance, how long does it on average take to get security clearances? Um, you know, it really, it varies by person. Um, I would say probably 80 to 85% of the people have it by the end of the summer. So they're in kind of that three months. The upside of being young and in college is that you probably haven't moved around a lot, but um, depending on, you know, who you are and how many times you've moved in your life can really have a strong impact because the more places you've been in your life, the more people they have to go back and check with. Um, so for somebody that's in college that has only had, you know, maybe two or three addresses in their lives, um, to get it in that three-month time period is, is reasonable. At I least can, a clearance. I can speak from personal experience. It took me about three and a half years to get mine because I am an active duty military spouse and we've moved a lot. Yep. Um, how has the AFRL Scholars Program been impacted by COVID-19 closures? Are those students being deferred to next year? Um, they're actually they're actually trying to do it online. Um, I haven't. I know with the few that we have at DI that are working with the STEM program, um, they're still helping with our online execution of legacy and our and um, working remotely on you know some processes for our Lego program and that sort of thing. Um, but they are doing uh, some of the research ones online as well or remotely. So the kids are staying, the students are staying home, the scholars are staying home um, and not coming into the lab. How do I know if my research may be of interest to AFRL Munitions Directorate? Um, best thing is to take a look at the brochure that I believe is available up on the website as a resource. A um, lot more information in there. Um, if you think you might have a match, you know, by all means, reach out to us and also keep an eye out for when we have our university days and other calls for collaboration, you know, look at those specific topics and, and see if what you're working on is, is in line with those. All right. I'm just going to quickly look up if we have any questions from the YouTube group. So I'll make sure you guys are not forgotten over there. All right, thank you, uh, Director Fries. I know we have some additional questions about citizenship requirements for SFFP, and we'll work in the background to get those answers for everyone. Yeah, and those definitions are on the links once we can get the links out to folks. Mm -hmm. Next up, I am proud to introduce Adranos Incorporated. We, speaking from Adranos, we have Brandon Terry and Stephen Cobert. Adranos is developing next generation solid rocket propellants and they were originally started with AVOSR basic research funding through fellowships and AMIRI. They've made great strides in commercializing their technology and they're a real success story when it comes to moving from basic research to applications. So if you'll excuse me, this will just take a second to transition properly and we'll get started with them. All right, thank you for the uh, introduction. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. All right. So uh, again, my name is Dr. Brandon Terry. I'm the co-founder and chief technology officer of Adronis Incorporated, which is a company that I started at the tail end of my PhD at Purdue University back in 2015. So I'm just going to tell a little bit about 
the roadmap and uh, and how we got to where we are today. Um, One more click and you should have control. There we go. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about, you know, how I got to where I am. So I grew up in Las Vegas. My dad was a uh, defense contractor um, out at the Nevada test site. And uh, growing up, I got really big into Boy Scouts. And as part of that, you, I worked on Space Exploration Merit Badge. And, and with that uh, Merit Badge, we built little rockets, you know, about that big. And we launched them, and I really enjoyed it. And so I talked with my dad, who's an engineer, and he goes, oh, great, something nerdy I can do with my son. So we started building bigger and bigger rockets. And by the time I had graduated from high school, we had built some pretty big rockets. And I decided that rockets and propulsion, that this is something that I would like to do for uh, my job. So I looked at who some of the big uh, defense contractors were in the area. And a big one was at the time Thiokol, you know, which later became ATK and now is Northrop Grumman. And I looked where they heavily recruited from. And that was out at the University of Utah. So I made my way from Vegas up to Salt Lake City. Um, where I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, and I did an emphasis in aerospace. That also provided me an opportunity to do an internship. Um, and I did a three-year internship with Hill Air Force Base with the uh, ICBM Systems Group of the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center. Um, and that was a very good opportunity. I, it was three years where I worked uh, um, part-time during the school year and full-time during the summer. And uh, by the end of that internship, when I finished off my, uh, my degree at the University of Utah, um, I, I decided that looking around at the landscape at the different uh, contractors we were working with and looking at uh, what I'd like to do with my degree and all of the involvement that we were seeing with small businesses that I really wanted to get a PhD because I, I knew that if I wanted to do uh, some fun research and uh, be the one that's driving what's going on. I was really going to need a PhD for my uh, for my degree. And so again, I looked around at what universities did work with what I wanted to do, and that was solid rocket propellants. And what came out uh, as a good fit for me was Purdue University. So uh, made my way out to Purdue University, and uh, in the bottom left corner there, you can see. Uh, Zucro Laboratories, which is a world-renowned research institution that's specifically geared towards combustion and propulsion research. It's on the outskirts of the university uh, next to an airfield, a lot of open space. We can do a lot of fun things. And this is where the convergence with um, AFOSR comes in, because uh, I had a really good professor, um, Dr. Stephen Sun, and one of the things that he pushes all of his new graduate students to do is to get a fellowship. Now, of course, you know, getting a fellowship is good for him because uh, now his, uh, the stipend and the tuition for his, stu uh, his students uh, can get diminished, um, but there's a very big push towards that. So we, I applied to all of the fellowships that I could that were geared towards the propulsion area. And the, the, these are the um, four fellowships that I applied to. So uh, NDSCG, uh, a NASA fellowship, a SMART fellowship, uh, and the NSF fellowship. Um, and one thing that was very interesting that we did um, in our group when we applied for these that actually ended up yielding very good results, not just with me, but with many of the graduate students, was doing investigations into who is going to be reviewing these fellowship proposals. Because it's not the same group every time that reads them, or at least it's, it's often not. Uh, they'll, they'll divvy those around from year to year of who's going to be actually reading the applications. And uh, my advisor would go through and talk to his contacts to see who was getting the fun task of reviewing a bunch of proposals. And so the, the year that, that I was applying for this, we found out that NDSCG was going to be reviewed by Crane uh, down in uh, Southern Indiana, not too far from Purdue. And we figured out you know, who was going to be doing those reviews. And so what I was able to do is do research into what was the type of research that the people that were going to be reviewing my application did. And for them, it was they worked on flares. And so 
as you know, when you're doing these fellowship applications, the, the proposal that you put, the, the work that you propose, isn't necessarily the work that you're gonna do uh, for your research. It's more about showing that you can uh, have the mindset for doing a proposal and for getting some work done. So I, I wrote some good proposals and I was awarded the NDSCG fellowship and that was funded through the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Um, so that covered the rest of my graduate degree uh, up until I graduated. Now, uh, at the same time that I was awarded that fellowship, my PhD advisor, uh, Dr. Sun, was also awarded a MURI, so a multidisciplinary university research initiative, to look at um, energetic materials research, so propellants, explosives, and pyrotechnics, right where I wanted to be. And so this divergence, and that MIRI was also through the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. So in a short period of time, I now had two funding mechanisms, one for my salary and my tuition, and the other one for the actual research, both through the Office of Scientific Research. Um, and I was able to get going on my research. And I'll, I'll just talk really briefly on what that research was. What I was doing is uh, looking at solid rock propellant. Now, solid rock propellant as we know it in general has not really changed since the 50s. This is pretty much the formula. You have a fuel, an oxidizer, and a binder, and the fuel is aluminum, oxidizer to ammonium perchlorate, and you have a rubber to hold it together. And when you burn that, you create some gas, some heat, and then there's a byproduct of some acid, so HCl at the end. Now, what I spent my PhD doing was how can I modify aluminum fuel? I was taking aluminum and I was adding stuff to it. And I was mixing this stuff with aluminum at a very, very small scale. Uh, so basically nanometrically combined. And what I was looking at for the majority of my PhD is what stuff will make this burn well. And uh, after doing years and years of research, several publications, um, at the end, when I was kind of putting all this together into my dissertation, I decided, you know, if I really wanted to look at what this stuff was, and we had access to a, a mini supercomputer, I threw just a bunch of simulations at it, uh, hundreds of thousands of simulations, and, and, and asked the computer to tell me what the stuff should, uh, should be. And actually what came out of that was, oh, you should try that stuff should be lithium, which is not something that I had tried during my PhD. I was hoping that the stuff that it would kick out would, would be something that I'd already investigated, but of course that doesn't happen. And so this looked really interesting. And the reason why this lithium looks good is because if you replace your aluminum fuel with an aluminum lithium alloy at a, at, a, at a specific ratios, what ends up happening is that HCl, that acid byproduct goes away, it becomes lithium chloride salt. All of that hydrogen that was getting tied up to form the acid, now moves over and becomes more hydrogen gas. So uh, essentially we're creating more gas when we burn and that gives you higher performance. And so we were able to not only make an environmentally cleaner formulation, we were also able to have it be higher performance because we're creating more gas. And so I'm finishing uh, this up. I come up with this new novel thing. My advisor says, you know, we need to put a patent out on this. Things are looking good. And this time I'm, finishing up my dissertation, and it's that place where you have to diverge. You need to pick something you're gonna do. Uh, quite a few uh, of my colleagues you know, went off to academia, uh, had quite a few that went off and worked at various Department of Defense labs, many of which were discussed today, as well as Department of Energy labs. Um, many of them went off to uh, go for prime contractors, uh, work in the Department of Defense, um, See so some of the big names here. And I actually did have at this time a, an open offer with one of these major defense contractors, um, <clears throat> as well as going over to the newly emerging private space. And several of my colleagues had moved over to, uh, to Blue Origin and SpaceX, which were just uh, starting to emerge um, as, as relevant actors in the space industry. And uh, so as I'm going through this design, uh, through this decision process of what I wanna do with my PhD, I decide, you know, I'm gonna take a different road altogether. And I went down the road of, I'm gonna take this new idea, this new thing that came at the very end of my PhD, I haven't even done anything with it yet, but if this works, it has great potential. So um, I decided to go off an entrepreneur and the last semester I was at college, I took a class, um, ended up auditing it, because pretty much everybody took it for auditing because it was mostly faculty. 
uh, a class at Purdue University. Now, one thing to remember is most universities, especially tier one universities, have um, very good departments that uh, help faculty and staff transition technologies. And, and Purdue has a, has a pretty good one. And they put out a class that's taught, I think it was about once a year, Life of a Faculty Entrepreneur. And it was um, a class that, uh, that, that teaches faculty and students of, that have a technology how to transition it into a company. And what their tagline is, is transitioning research into tangible products. But after having taken this class, I decided the real tagline should have been CTO 101, how to find and communicate with a CEO, because they basically show you with clear uh, data that if you try and, uh, as the inventor, go off and become a C CEO and get it to work, chances are very much against you uh, that it's going to work. And so uh, I took that, um, the things that I learned in this class and found um, found someone that I could bring on as a CEO and a co-founder, and we started Adronos Energetics uh, out of Purdue University. But it's one thing to start a company. It's another thing to actually you know, survive and put food on the table while you do it. So what I did is I, uh, so how to pay for it, I stayed in my lab. I stayed as a postdoc. And uh, so I pretty much was able to um, continue right on with my research where I left it off on the simulations and start looking at it at the benchtop small scale and show that what the supercomputer was telling us we should see was actually something that we would see in practice. Now, at the same time that as there's a postdoc, there's another little thing that I had not known about until I took the, uh, that um, life of a faculty entrepreneur class is that there are things called business plan competitions. And as long as you are affiliated with a university, you can participate in these business plan competitions. And so there are several of them around the US. Um, most of them are in the springtime. Um, and we went to several of these and we took first place uh, or at least placed in every one of them. And uh, by the time that I had finished, uh, I guess you call it a season of business plan competitions, uh, my company had raised enough non-dilutive capital through winning business plan competitions that we were uh, able to stop my postdoc and move transition to being uh, full time uh, with the company. Now, the only other reason the reason we were able to go full time is not only did we win this non-dilutive capital, but we also got non-dilutive capital through another program which we've talked about today, which was the STTR and SBIR program. We had gotten awarded an STTR. Uh, through the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, which is a uh, multi-agency um, research uh, group within the uh, Department of Defense, so DITRA. And so we, we were awarded in a DITRA STTR, and so that was with Purdue and um, our company, Adranos, and we got to work. Uh, now, after I left the university and we got this first STTR, uh, I was then able to go on and get lots of other sources of capital to continue the research of this technology. Um, if you look around, there are lots of different avenues for you as a researcher to apply to, uh, to get different funds. So we had moved our development over to the state of Utah and uh, Utah had a um, s and or a science and technology uh, group that was trying to help small businesses develop technologies. It was called USTAR. So we were able to get in with USTAR. We got uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars of, uh, of research money to continue what we we're doing through that program. Um, we've gotten more SBIRs since that initial STTR. Um, we found an angel investor um, who was able to supply, uh, you know, enough. That, that was the only dilutive funds that we, that we took to uh, get this work. But um, an angel investor not only helps with funds, but helps with, uh, the, typically an angel investor has lots of experience transitioning technologies. So more than just someone bankrolling the research, they're also able to um, be a great source of information on, on how to navigate the transition landscape. And uh, the last one I want to talk about was uh, XTech Search. Uh, so this, we were the inaugural winners of XTech Search 1.0. Uh, this is a, uh, um, a competition that was uh, hosted by the Army. And this was a uh, Started two years ago, the competition ended last year. Uh, hundreds of companies applied and uh, through several uh, gates of um, 
down selection. The, the companies were down selected until finally they, they awarded uh, every company some money to do a live demonstration before army personnel of your technology. And so at the end of X Tech Search, with the money that we that we were given through that program, we did a live uh, launch for the Army. This was performed uh, outside of Las Vegas in the Mojave Desert. And I'll show you a quick video here. I apologize if it's uh, choppy for some people. Um, and this is gonna be a, just a video from the live launch that we did for the Army. So uh, what we did with this launch was we, we, we took a single platform um, and we launched it multiple times with both the standard state-of-the-art solid rock propellant, uh, compared it versus our higher performance environmentally cleaner propellant. And we showed that we were able to um, consistently outperform the uh, total apogee of the rocket, uh, which corresponded nicely with our benchtop testing we'd done with static test fires. And uh, be because of the results from that launch, we were the inaugural winners of XTech Search 1.0 and, was, and were, was granted a uh, large, again, non-dilutive check that was uh, able to help us continue our uh, internal um, research and development on this technology. So uh, since then, and this was uh, last year that this, that happened, we uh, have moved on. We are building a facility for producing our new fuel uh, in uh, in Indiana, and we are also uh, now in this facility here in uh, in Texas, where we have uh, 350 acres to um, to mix, cast, and test solid rocket propellants and store them. Uh, also, uh, last uh, yes, I believe it. Yeah, last year uh, we were part of the Air Force Space Pitch Day. Uh, we we discussed earlier in uh, this meeting. We talked about the uh, open-ended uh, SBIR with the Air Force, and this is what this was. So we did an open-ended um, SBIR for the phase one. Uh, we were able to find many people across several branches of the military to support uh, our phase two so that we went and presented that at the uh, Air Force Space Pitch Day. This was back in November. And uh, we were awarded a phase two on the spot at Air Force Pit, uh, Space Pitch Day. So that's a contract that we're actively uh, working on right now. And uh, so that's kind of the roadmap for, you know, how I took a technology from the, you know, a, initial conception at the tail end of my PhD, um, something that we, we had, didn't even have time to fully research as part of my PhD, but was able to quickly transition to a company, perform research within the university architecture until we were in a stable um, position to uh, transition it, move it over to uh, company full time, and then uh, work to where we are today, where we are actively um, actively continuing on and um, uh, working with the DoD to commercialize this technology. And uh, I think there's one more slide. There it is. Um, so I'm open for any questions that you have on this. All right. Thank you very much. So let me just bring up the questions that we've been collecting. For the first question, what advice would you give to an up and coming science entrepreneur regarding how they can work with their university business office to find the resources for funding grants and starting a small business? So as I discussed uh, earlier, most universities have a, an office or an organization that that is specifically geared towards tech transfer. And so um, at Purdue University, it was called the Bort Burton Morgan uh, Center. And so uh, coordinating with them, they are a very much a crash course. And here are non-dilutive capital sources that you can go at to, to transition it. Here are, um, uh, here's how you work with dilutive capital to uh, transition it. And, uh, and, the universities are very much set up to hold your hand through the process until you're at the position where you can be on your own two feet. Excellent. And then what were some of the ups and downs for the grant application process for you? 
So sadly, with the MURI um, that was funding the research side of my PhD, um, as a graduate student, I was not privy to that grant application part of the process. But like I said, with the uh, um, with the fellowship, the NDSCG fellowship, um, it, it's all about knowing who your audience is and, and, and just writing the proposal for that. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is not only did um, our professor help us to figure out who was gonna be doing the, uh, the reviews, but he also provided us with a large portfolio of past graduate students that had won that particular fellowship. So for all five of, or four of those that I applied to, the NDSCG, SMART, the NASA, uh, I think it's called the NSPIRES NASA Fellowship and the uh, NSF Fellowship, um, they, uh, my professor provided me with a large stack of, app, of proposals that had been granted, so I, as well as ones that had not, um, so that we were able to see what were the pros and cons to those of why they got funded, why they did not get funded. And so by, by utilizing, knowing who your audience is and, and knowing what has worked and not worked in the past is a, is a really good leg up on that. Sorry, Matt, you're on mute. Yeah, on mute. This one is for Brandon and Stefan. Matt should only do that once the entire presentation. That's not <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> once you knew you had something special in your research, how did you navigate the transition of your research from basic through applied and finally to the commercial sector? So from you know basic to applied to transition i mean basic like i said it's it's more just you're you're at the university you are um proving out the science at the best bench top scale and that's really where that muri plays a role and where my fellowship played a role now when it comes to applied research uh so kind of transitioning from six one to six two that's where the sbir and sttr really is america's seed fund uh, those kind of avenues, as well as several other BAAs out there, X Tech Search um, that we worked with, those are those are great avenues to do that initial um, transition from here's my basic research six one idea, transition it to six two, and then uh, and right now we're in that process of of transitioning that six two research into six three, uh, which is the the real start of the commercialization aspect of it, and. Uh, and I think a big piece towards making that successful is making sure you have good stakeholders in all of the branches that, that are uh, potential um, end users of the technology. So for, for solid rocket propellant, it's, it's not just the Air Force, um, but the Air Force is a big picture of it. Uh, so we have stakeholders at AFRL Edwards that, that we make sure are, are kept aggrieved of uh, what we're doing, but also the Navy at China Lake and the Army down at Redstone. We have uh, personnel at, at all those locations as well as, as many of the other locations around such as uh, Eglin Air Force Base, ARL, um, Picatinny, uh, making sure that all the, the, the right people that could, are potential end users of technology know what's going on and that you have uh, consistent uh, communication or feedback with them at, the, at relevant conferences and, and relevant uh, activities. Yeah, I would, I would add real quickly that the uh, AFWorks uh, phase one SBIR, a big component of that is making sure that the small business is dialoguing with end users. So people who potentially, when you talk about translation, who could be the potential um, person that would end up with your developed technology and what are their problems and pain points? And really diving in to make sure that uh, you understand their circumstances, their needs, their objectives, and how your science or technology might solve their problem. Um, and then if you can if you can link and find those parties, you you are well on your way of finding a route to getting your technology, um, you know. And, and you go through the phase one, the phase two, and the phase three for SBIR. That that's right along with going from again kind of research and investigation to uh, you know maybe scaling up or some translational research. And a phase three, you can start to get a prototype or something um, that could be almost fielded. So go there. All right, thank you very much. 
We have a minute, so we still have some members from the AFOSR on the line. I want to take advantage of all the time we've got and loop back and ask a couple of questions that we didn't have a chance for earlier. So do we still have representatives from AFOSR on the line, Colonel A.V.? Hi, Matt. Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Um, one question that we had is, how do we find opportunities within the agency for international collaborative proposals? So I'm not quite sure if uh, the person asking the question is interested in having a US university um, you know, engage with international universities or international organizations, or if they're interested, they're an international organization, university interested in somehow working with AFOSR. Um, I would recommend going to the broad agency announcement, the same thing everybody's been saying, but um, and reaching out to the program officer that seems to have the most uh, re or the closest relationship to the area of research they're interested in. And then they or Calvin, because he gave out his information, will be able to link them up with the appropriate program officer at the right international office. Because each of our international program officers do have focus areas as well. And then from YouTube, we had this question and I do have a small answer for it, but how can you get invited to a program reviews? So our program reviews are posted on that APAN site. And while you have to register, they are open to the public. And I should note some program reviews are actually closed due to the nature of the work they're going over. Okay, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions and answers right now. You have been a fantastic audience and have wrote, talked up some very insightful questions. I'd like to once again thank Brandon and Stefan from Adranos. Thank you for your great presentation. And we're going to be going on to our closing slide. And I'm proud to introduce Ashley Coleman. She's our BRIC Collaboration and Outreach Manager. Hey everyone, I'm Ashley Coleman. I manage outreach and partnership efforts with the BRIC. This has been a great event and we would like to thank AFOSR and the OSD Basic Research Office for supporting this event. And we also want to give a special thank you to our PIA partners who joined us today. Each of our organizations plays a role in supporting the AFRL mission. Separately, this is achieved through specialized efforts spanning data analytics to outreach engagements, from T2 commercialization to workforce development. These collective collaborations build a network of support and innovation that when combined is a pretty powerful way to reach a wide audience. If you're interested in learning more or partnering with us, please feel free to contact us through our website. As we mentioned, this is the first event of a series and we'll be hosting another one next quarter. So thanks for joining us and we hope to see you next time. All right, we're going to be closing out the presentation shortly. I am currently at this time ending the recording. A large number of you have asked about the recording and I am going to say that we're going to try to get this out as soon as possible. It's gonna take a little while for the file to process, but then we'll have it up on the APAN site. Let's see if we can drop that APAN link into the um, chat one more time. And we just want to thank everyone for coming out today and a special thank you to all of our speakers and who did a great job presenting their organizations. Thank you so much.